All right, friends, Zig coming in at the top today on the show. We have Marky Ray, uh, mercenary of rock. Marky Ray's career is so uh, um, immense and in, in, intense, but you might know him from uh, um, Death of Samantha, Terrible Parade, Death on a Stick. He was the Rolling Stones stage crew for a while. He was working with The Who as a stage crew, same with Pink Floyd, Nine Inch Nails. He was a what they call an everything guy where he's playing on stage uh, like running like so he gets real into this shit in the conversation but uh, um ministry Lollapalooza. he worked the first two as a technician for so many bands and roomed with the rollins band on the bus um butthole surfers the toadies and the list goes on nirvana like this was an intense interview like as far as just even knowing where to start with Marky Ray was insane and it's even more insane because it was all non-stop all the all these bands he was working in and playing in was happening at the same time um he's got a lot of really cool oh, deep dive ohio punk rock albums out uh, or punk rock tracks and like ohio music history on his um soundcloud Marky Ray also on youtube if you go to Marky Ray 13 spelled out um, you can see a lot of videos of what we're talking about marky ray also has a book called mercenary of rock and it's uh it's kind of his method and story of how how to do all this stuff how to book a tour how to manage a stage um definitely check that out if you're an inspire uh, aspiring musician and you want to know how how it was done and is done marky ray's book is definitely a personal insight to that and i recommend it um also the last band he played in not the last band one of the last bands he played in 3d um there's rumors that there may be uh, some new 3d tracks coming out so look out for that and if you want to learn firsthand marky is a professor a teacher at tri c he run, works with the rat program uh recording arts and technology at tri c metro so check into that before we get into the interview, um, this podcast is mixed by Studio 44. Studio 44, for any audio or visual needs you may have, you can reach out to Studio 44 Cleveland. Reach out to Jay Sparrow, and he can make your uh, your podcast or your song sound this good. Also, um, if you can like, subscribe, rate, review the podcast on all the podcast platforms. We're also on social media, on Instagram, and on the YouTube, and on the uh, Twitter if you can follow us or give us a shout out on something there, it really helps out. It helps me keep talking to cool people and sharing those insights with you. So without further ado, Marky Ray. Yakking at Poison Ivy because I couldn't find anything on her. But yeah. I know that was a big part of the Akron scene. Um, yeah. Well, she was from uh, she was from Lakewood. Uh, yeah. And um, Lux was from Stowe. And... Uh, they met in California, ironically, <laughs> strangely, and um, they put the cramps together in the late, mid to late seventies in Ohio. A lot of people think they're a New York band or a LA band, but they really, uh, they 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 sort of started playing out more in New York, but they did form here. Right. And uh, I'm I'm dear friends with Lux's uh, younger brother, Michael Michael Perkheiser. And uh, I used to work for the Cramps, so uh, through Michael, and um, so yeah, I'm I'm just one of many people who uh, worship at the uh, worship at the feet of the Cramps. I mean, uh, they were uh, extraordinary people and uh, an extraordinary influential band, and uh, yeah, that's uh, it's a pretty neat thing. It's 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 amazing to see how they still continue to be a huge influence on um music and culture and and uh i mean everything from the look to the sound uh, uh somebody posted something on facebook just yesterday it was the um let's see it was uh, <clears throat> the the uh, demo sessions uh of of some uh, it's like called the ohio demos and michael uh, lux's brother had actually recorded those back in like 79 okay. i believe Wow. And uh, it's 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 right before Psychedelic Jungle came out, I think, or maybe it might be songs the Lord taught us. But uh, but Michael recorded them. It sounds fantastic. It was it was their version of uh, Rock and Bones or Raw Bones. It was really cool. That's and I was sick. like, it was just neat to hear. So yeah, no, that's super cool. And it, they, I don't know, those guys can take any cover and make it sick. You know what I mean? Like yeah, 
Oh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, Lux was probably the greatest front man I ever worked for and ever saw, for that matter. Um, I also had the privilege of working for the Dead Boys and, and Stiv Bader a few times. Uh, when he was in, mostly I, I met Stiv when he was in Lords of the New Church. Uh, I, I sort of bridged the gap in the Cleveland punk scene between the 70s punks and the 80s punks. I'm sort of right sort of there in the middle. Um, I came onto the scene as a player in the in the early 80s. And, uh, but I used to work for the Pagans and I used to, uh, so I, I was, I, w I kind of, uh, I sort of uh, grafted on to a lot of the early punks because they were still playing around even in the early 80s when I got, uh, when I sort of arrived back in Cleveland. I was born and raised in Cleveland, went away to school, got kicked out of high school in the middle of my senior year and moved back to Cleveland and immediately started working and playing with different people in the scene. And I was really lucky because, uh, you know, just getting to work for the pagans was really eye opening. And that that's when they opened for Lords of the new church at the old Agora. And that's when I first met Stiv. And, um, you know, I can't say I knew him well, but he was an incredible front man. And I were, I pretty much worked every subsequent Lords of the new church sh uh, show in, in, uh, Cleveland and, and, I ended up working for the Dead Boys when they reformed in the mid '80s at the Agora, at the newer Agora, when it moved over to the old Hippodrome on 55th, and uh, the Infidels were their backing band. The Youngstown band, the Infidels, were backing uh, Cheetah and Stiv uh, as sort of like the reformed Dead Boys. That was about 1985 or six, maybe somewhere around that time. It was like kind of on a break, or maybe. Lords of the New Church had broken up around that time, I think, and they, they were, it might have been before they, I think they might have reformed shortly thereafter and tried to pick it up again, but, uh, and then, of course, Stiv died, sadly, uh, later in the 80s, or maybe those early 90s, I can't, I, you know, these dates are, just so many years have gone by, I can never remember everything, you know, the top, the top line of stuff. I mean, with your resume, like with all, just in that time period, everything you had going on, like, oh, it's, it's incredible. I, I are you hip to the movie uh, Zelig by uh, uh, Woody Allen? Uh, it's it's, a, it's about a historical. Well, it's about this guy who's always at these like the the synopsis of it. It's about a, a guy who travels through time and he's always in these sort of historical, you know, happenings. And, right. and it's it kind of predated Forrest Gump by by many decades, mind you, but uh, or at least a couple decades. It was a mid '80s film, but I, I often say I have a Zelig like career because I really was lucky to get to do all the things I did. You know, from um, you know there there was um, I mean just just every kind of imaginable thing I was able to sort of dip my toe in from like working for rockabilly bands like the Kingpins in New York City, and Brian Hudson was the drummer. Uh, Brian Hudson from the Pagans was the drummer in that band and that got me hooked in with the Pagans in Cleveland as well because I'd gone to high school with one of the Kingpins and uh, I used to go up to New York City even before I was out of high school and uh, and uh, work for bands up there and, and his band and then I'd uh, uh, I'd come back to Cleveland and, and when the Kingpins would tour I'd hop I'd hop in the van or truck with them and the pagans were on that those tours as well so I got to work and tour with them so you know um I befriended Mike and Brian Hudson and um you know and, and got to work with them but at the same time I was playing in local bands that were sort of making their way up the you know the the food chain um I played in um Jeez, I, I first played in this band called Johnny Action, and we, we ended up opening for a band in Kent that was one of my favorites that I used to see in my late teens called the F Models. I used to use my brother's fake ID, his <laughs> college. Well, it was his college yeah. ID. It was a fake ID to me. So I used to go over to Kent, JB specifically, JB's downstairs, and see the F Models, who were like this, fronted by this late, this wonderful guy named I Ignition. His real name was Robert Morningstar. And, um, he he was I I wrote a tribute to him called uh the rock star in our midst. He was kind of like Johnny Thunders, you know, meets um, uh, Keith Richards rolled into one. You know, he had, he was handsome and charismatic and chiseled and you know man crush material. You know, right, right. and he and he he was a great front man. And the F models wrote these really bitterly sarcastic songs. You know, a sardonic. Uh, things like God Save Chrysler and uh, Nobody Loves Me But My Mom. And I used to see these guys all the time, and they were just fantastic. So 
when my band Johnny Action opened for them, this was like late nineteen or mid nineteen eighty two. And was uh, Michael was Michael playing with you then? Uh, no, no. I, th- th- this all happened around the same time. Okay. So I, I, I'll lead up to that. So what happened was is uh, uh, that some that that one night we played in Kent at JB's downstairs. Right. Um, Johnny Action opening for the F Models. Um, Johnny Teagle and Bob Bassone from the Johnny Clamp at the Walkers saw me play that show, and we with the Johnny Action did some rockabilly during their set. And I, I said there was a couple Stray Cats covers or something, and you know, and they, and they were covers of other older rockabilly songs, you know. So uh, I was covering somebody else's cover, <laughs> uh, and so uh, I met Johnny Teagle and Bob Bassone that night, and that sort of became my key to the Kent scene because Johnny Action broke up after that gig. I moved back to my parents' house near Kent and started going to Kent all the time and uh, started playing, singing and playing upright bass with Johnny Clamp at the Walkers. And around that time, Michael Perkheiser's band, The Action, was playing all the time at uh, Kent and in JB's and Mother's. So I met Michael then and everybody was like, oh, that's Lux's brother, that's Lux's brother. And of course, you know, I mean, I, I hadn't worked for them then yeah. yet, you know, but I met I met Michael and befriended him and we weren't super tight then, but he, Michael was very gregarious, very outgoing, but he was a serious songwriter, singer and stuff. And everybody respected him and everybody loved him. And he was an incredible, he is an incredible guitarist and inventor. I mean, he makes his own compressors and his own amplifiers and the guy's a freaking genius and an amazing singer, you know? So uh, I befriended him then and I played in the walking clampets for about nine months. And then that band broke up. They're actually no uh, Johnny. Here's a funny thing. Johnny Teagle actually kicked me out of the band because I was too serious. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved back to Cleveland and just proceeded to whore around town to get another gig with a band. So uh, around that time, the human switchboard from Kent, who I used to buy records from in the in the mid seventies in the record store in Kent. Uh, had moved up to Cleveland and I was living in the same building as them. So I knew them. I'd known them for years at this point. And I was, you know, I was starting to do some roadie work and tech work like I'd done for the Kingpins and the Pagans at this point. So the human switchboard were going to New York and they're like, hey, we're going to New York and Boston to record and do a tour. You want to, you know, you, you can tune a guitar, right? I'm like, yeah, you can drive, right? Yeah, so <laughs> hop in the van. So I started doing tours like with the human switchboard and shit like that. Uh, you know, and I'd done stuff with the, with the, the pagans and the kingpins too. So I, I started getting this reputation as this touring guy. And, um, so all this crazy shit happened at once. And then, uh, I got back from that and then I ran into this guy named Mike Arnovitz, who was the manager of, um, Arabica in Cleveland Heights. And, okay. uh, he and his partner, were, were music promoters. So they started, uh, they brought the band Men Without Hats, you know, safety yep. dance. And yep. Anyways, it brought them to the engineer's hall downtown where the Dead Kennedys had played like a year earlier. And I worked for them as a production manager for their show that day in a roadie. So that started another line of my work being becoming a production manager, roadie, everything guy, kind of learning the ropes. And I got more, I got known more as this guy who did all this shit. You know, played in a musician who did, who worked for people. You know, right. ran sound, did various things. So that led to, you know, lo and behold, I started playing, trying to play some solo gigs around. And a friend of mine introduced me to this guy named Alan Grandy, who had this band called The Terrible Parade. And uh, he was looking for it. They were a trio, and they had, ironically had come from Kent too. Alan was from Philadelphia. He'd gone to OU, and then he moved to Kent State to finish his studies at Kent State. And they there was a three-piece band: Frank Pursuit, Alan Grandy, and Scott Pickering from a million bands. If you know Scott Pickering, he's played with everybody. Um, so they had moved up to Cleveland and found a new drummer, this guy Paul Strachan. So it was Franklin, Paul, and Alan, and then I joined as the second guitarist. So we started playing more gigs and Mike Arnovitz, the guy from the engineer or from Arabica became our manager. And uh, we started terrible parade started playing out and I was going to Cleveland state after that. And uh, the guys from death of Samantha formed, you know, right around that time. And I was going to school with them. So they became friends and I was friends with Dave Swanson uh, because he'd had bands like the reactions and they were playing in town and, uh, so all of us kind of met and went to school together. You know, the Doug Gillard is now in Guided by Voices and uh, Not a Surf. You know, he's uh, 
he was a, a classmate. John Petkovic from Death of Samantha was a classmate. Oh, um, so all these all these cats would later come into focus in different bands and things. Uh, we all went to school together, Cleveland State. So I'm playing the scene. I'm working for bands, uh, playing in the Terrible Parade. And, um, you know, I, I Johnny Clamp and the Walkers uh, came back to town. Only they, were, they shortened the name to just the Walking Clampets. And that's when I started to really befriend Michael is because they started playing gigs opening for people and I'd go down and help out. Bob Bassone is still one of my dear friends. He's like brother Bob, you know, he's got two other brothers, but I've known Bob Bassone probably the longest of anybody in the scene. He's one of my oldest, dearest friends. And he was the bass player in, in the walking clamp. And so he invited me down. They were opening for Brian Setzer at Peabody's. So I went down there and, and uh, we opened for, you know, or I shouldn't say we, because I didn't play that show. I just worked it for him. It's but that's when I really team. got to know. <laughs> yeah, I was part of the team, and I always have been. So, which was funny, because, you know, even though Johnny had Johnny kicked me out of the band, I was still buds with him. I still love the guy, you know. So, and they were great with Michael. I mean, there's no denying that is, uh, with Michael Perkheiser fronting the Walking Clamp, and they were just an amazing band. And, you know, even though the, you know, 90% of their material or more was, was old covers, nobody knew it, because they were old, obscure rockabilly songs and stuff, you know, and they were just right. fantastic. So I, I befriended Michael, and we became pretty, you know, we became tight, but, you know, not super tight. I mean, none of us were, we all lived in different cities and different things but i mean we're friends as much as pre-internet days were you know pick up the phone and call somebody so the cramps came to the fantasy and once again i worked in the walking clampets went and and opened for them so that was the first time i worked for the cramps and then um you know and and walking clampets so we all hung out and i got to meet lux and ivy and i i can't say i knew them well then and not that i ever got to really know them well when you work for them you know right. they're people but you right. but they were so i worked for them and they were they were really nice and uh you know uh, i too was a fanboy got their autographs and well, <laughs> wow, i worked for the cramps and you know and of course yeah. you gotta you gotta keep in mind michael's had to live in the shadow of his brother for a long time and not that he's bitter about it because he's not he loved he loved his brother dearly but michael was the player in the family before Lux. I mean, Lux kind of almost followed in Michael's footsteps because Michael was the guitar player in the family. Michael was the musician in the family before Lux. I mean, you know, uh, so Michael kind of even assisted the cramps in their formation in some respects because he was like, you know, Ivy hadn't started playing guitar and she's like, what should I play? And Michael's like, you should play this and, right. you know, try this amplifier. So he kind of, you know, uh, he kind of steered them and a little bit, you know, I mean, they were their own entity. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they, you know, he, and, and Michael talks specifically about the fact that Lux was his inspiration when he was growing up because Lux was like, not, I think Lux is a good deal older than Michael. I'm not sure how many years, but, um, a number of years older than Michael. And, and, you know, he was grown when Michael was still in, you know, in junior high school and, and high school and stuff. But Lux was like, Michael told me stories about Lux telling him in like 63, like there's this band, the Beatles and this other band, the Rolling Stones, you're going to have to check them out, man. They're going to blow up, <laughs> you, you know? And, yeah. and, you know, and, and Michael's like, wow, you know, cause Lux was really hip, you know, he was really hip into art. He was really smart about, music and stuff and when he and ivy got together they used to go on these long you know tracks and hit up all these uh record stores thr right thr record stores and thrift right. stores and they'd buy 45s and they'd spend all their money on 45s and then have to call home and be like hey can we you know michael's parents were exceptionally cool so they'd so they'd send lux some money and you know and they'd they'd make it to their wherever they were going next you know and uh and they got this just incredibly strange connection to the music they loved from all this amazing music and they they sort of turned it on its head and were like this is what we're going to do with it and they did you know so they became the cramps and it was just like freaking incredible you know and, and they were they blew up initially and then just became this giant sort of cult band i mean they were like the ultimate cult band in a lot of respects because they never so much hit the mainstream but they they made a better living than like probably 90 percent of the bands i mean they were they were good for you know between 2,000 and 5,000 tickets in any city in the world and and they would go and play you know all over the world and and just be adored and worshipped you know and and that's really how i mean they i mean they did it for so long they they outlasted so many other contemporaries because they they you know they they were just so good at what they did you know right. they were they were brilliant ivy was a brilliant guitarist 
Uh, and of course, you know, they had some help along the way. Uh, Brian Gregory, uh, who I knew, you know, a little bit, Brian was a friend. Um, and I met him after uh, he'd been in the cramps, you know, before when Kid Congo was still in the band, uh, you know, and Brian and I used to hang out with Brian at the fantasy theater when the terrible parade used to play and or the fantasy nightclub. I mean, so I got to know him actually before I got to really know the cramps, the rest of the cramps. I knew Brian first and he'd already been out of the band by then. So it was, I, I sort of had this weird backwards way into working and, and seeing them and stuff and, and getting to know them a little bit. And, um, you know, as time marched on through, you know, I'd always go and sit in with the Clampets when they'd play. They'd play every Christmas because in about 1990 or so, I, I know I'm just really, you know, jumping over time here, but because I... Uh, it's following I, the narrative of that, you know. Yeah, well, it's crazy, too, because during that time... You go uh, doing a, a lot from, at that time. Yeah, I mean, I did, a, <laughs> I did a lot during that time. I went from, you know, from about 1983 to about 1988, I did mostly local stuff, but right. the, the local stuff I was doing, and I, I did some, I did some, you know, small little, you know, East Coast tours here and there, uh, but like with I was a, going... Like with, a, oh, I was going to say with, um, oh, I can't think of the name, uh, not uh, the new uh, Salem Witch Hunters, right? Oh, yeah, well, I, yeah, I did an East Coast tour with the Witch Hunters in 89 with right. the Samantha. We did an East Coast tour. That was really crazy. But that came, the funny thing is, is that came later because, like, the terrible parade at the height of what we were doing, you know, like 85, 86, even 87, we were touring. We toured the East Coast in 85 on our EP. And, you know, we played with the Volcano Suns at the Rat in Boston, and we played in Connecticut, and we played New York City and did some other stuff. And it was it was fabulous, you know. I played CBGBs and got to do that. You know, I played CBGBs a number of times with different bands. But but around 1985, I started playing in this in this noise group called Death, uh, Death on a Stick. And we were this industrial jazz band. Sick. <laughs> so we, yeah. were, we were we were contemporaries of like Sonic Youth and bands like that. And we'd go up to New York and play at like PS122 or Tin Pan Alley or CBGBs. And we'd play with all these noise bands and get great press up there and then come back to Cleveland. And it'd be like, you know, crickets chirping and stuff. <laughs> but we, we'd get great press. And it was a great time. But nobody knew what to do with us because we were an industrial jazz band. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, and during that time, I was still, um, I came up with this concept, okay, this is like 84, 85-ish. I'm laying in bed one night, and I'm thinking, you know, I've done all these things. I need to, like, come up with some sort of business plan. So I came up with a business card, and I'm like, you know, I know all these, I know how to do all this stuff. You know, I've done shows, built stages, done this crap, done technician shit, run sound, et cetera, et cetera. You know, play a musician, too, on all these different instruments. I'm like, I, I'm kind of like a mercenary. I'm a hired gun because a lot of people did used to hire me to be on their recordings. And I'd play with people. I'd play with anybody to have me, you know, any instrument, just. What do you want? You know, guitar, bass, vocals, fine. I'll do it, you know, because right. I wanted the experience. And I and that's how we were in the olden days, pre-internet, pre-everything. We just used to, people call you up and say, hey, I'd like to do a studio thing. Can you come on? Oh, sure. You know, let's go out to Beat, beat Farm was where we were all recorded. So uh, I came up with this business card. It said, Rock and Marky Ray, Rock and Roll Mercenary, Jack of All Musical Trades. And, I, and then it, at that time, it said, like, musician slash artist slash producer or production or some shit you know well that and definitely then, grew <laughs> oh yeah 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 the, the list really grew so i did all this stuff you know and, and then i put this business card out and there are still people today who come up to me and like Malky ray rock and roll mercenary how are you you know i mean like from somebody you know that happened to me once with robin hitchcock at south by southwest you know oh, shit. uh you know because uh, yeah. i Robin Hitchcock remembered me for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons he really loved me is because his daughter, Maisie, when I worked for Nine Inch Nails, I put her on the guest list for our last European tour show in 1991 at the Astoria in London. I put her on the guest list, and he was forever grateful to me for putting her on the guest list. Right. You well, know, so. that, that shit goes a long way, especially it, does. <laughs> it goes a long way. People remember that. Oh, it, it's it's very true. It's very true. And he was, and he's been nothing but gracious. I mean, uh, and the other time I got to introduce Robin Hitchcock to Rick Rubin and Al Jorgensen, that was that was on the second Lollapalooza tour. But that's that's another that's, story. So yeah. we're building our way up to there. So this is this is the mid '80s. You know, I did all this stuff with all these bands. So around 1990 or so, you know, and I and every every year because the Clampets had all moved to different locales. I forget when they originally broke up, but they broke up somewhere around uh, 89, 90. I think jo Johnny and Bob both moved to New York. Mike Hammer moved to Mikey Hammer moved to uh, 
uh, Atlanta, I think, first, and then he moved, and he's still in Atlanta. Anyways, so Mike Perkheiser was kind of left here, but I used to sit in with him, sing a couple songs with him, which I still do to this day. Right, Get up on with stage 3D. And on a couple of, yeah, yeah. So uh, around 1990 or so, um, I, I was, I'd been, actually, let me jump back two years. <laughs> I just finished college. Okay. This is how strange my, you know, and during this time, well, you know, from 85 to like 88 around this time, I started working for Belkin, you know, Belkin Productions. Right. And I also started working as a complete mercenary as like, a, a, you know, a total, like total stagehand, non-union stagehand. I later joined the union, but I was a complete hired gun for like the Rolling Stones and Pink Floyd and the Who, and and that I started working for Belkin. Belkin would hire me to do their stadium shows, and I started doing all the stadium shows and worked at the old Richfield Coliseum, you know, as a runner and a, you know, a gopher doing production and all sorts of shit for them. So I'm learning these ropes from like clubs to stadium levels. You know, I think like I've already made it. I've I've arrived, you know, at this level because I'm working these enormous stadium shows, you know, doing this crazy shit. And it's like, wow, you know, things just keep getting better and better. So around 1988, I graduate from college in August of 88. And two weeks later, I get a call from a friend of mine in New York, the former bass player from the Kingpins. He's like, hey, the Boston band, the Liars are looking for a bassist. And I'm like, are you hip to the Liars? I don't know if you are. Yeah, yeah. Either. All right, so I yeah the the so so Jeff Conley I call up Jeff Conley of the Liars, or maybe he called me I don't remember but he's like hey I heard you're a bass player I need a bass player I got get ready to do a U.S. tour we just released a record. Is and this I'm right like, when um uh, um terrible parade ended, ended kind of? Yeah, okay. I left Terrible Parade in May of '85. Okay, and just it was doing gigs with Death on a Stick. We did like the Studio Rama that year at WREW and stuff like okay. that. And we were still doing some gig, and we might have even played New York during that time. It's it's such a blur, I can't remember. But uh, so I, I I flew up to Boston, or actually I took Amtrak up to Boston, and um, and and live, my parents were on the south, had a house on the South Shore. So okay. I, I stayed with my parents for like a weekend or so. Started learning the chops of this record by the Liars. Went and rehearsed with them three times and played at the channel in front of like 2,000 people. And I joined the Liars for like four months on a U.S. Canadian tour. And that was absolutely, absolutely fucking insane. The mo I mean, it was, it was amazing and it was great, but it was absolutely fucking insane. And I can't even say that with like, without, it's like, we did like 60 dates literally around the edges of the continental U.S. and Canada. <laughs> we like started in port we started yeah. in like portland maine opening for bb buell who if, you, who if you know is was todd is Liv tyler's mom and was a rock and roller she used to be like lived with todd rungren and oh, okay. joe yeah, steven yeah. tyler and elvis costello and she was sort of a famous rock goddess so we opened for her. we played with her she actually opened for us we slept on her floor. I met Liv Tyler when she was like seven, you know, because she was living in the house with her mom. You know, she was a kid. Yeah, you know, the yeah, yeah. Kid then. It's just funny, you know. It is. And, uh, you know, we didn't know she was going to be famous. It was, yeah. it was just funny. So uh, we, 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 we proceeded to go, you know, go, go north and play Montreal and, and then over to, you know, Toronto and Guelph and, you know, all the way across Canada, literally, you know, Saskatoon, uh, fucking, you know, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, and all the way to Vancouver and then down the East Coast from, you know, Seattle to San Diego, from San Diego to, you know, Arizona to, to Austin to, you know, every place in between. I mean, just all the way down into, you know, across Louisiana into Florida, all the way up the East Coast and back to Boston over four months. And it was just the four guys in the van. Okay, just the four of us in a van, no crew, no sound man, no nothing. And we were all at each other's throats by like the first three weeks and nearly killed each other on several occasions. But we made it through that tour. It was amazing. And, you know, now we're all still friends. It's just it's just funny, though, that I survived that. So that was just like the That's beginning insane. of the insanity, you know. And uh, so I come back to Cleveland. I, I joined the New Salem Witch Hunters as their bassist, right, and and started working for the band Humble Pie, right. Uh, who who Jerry Shirley was in Cleveland at that time, so it was his version of hum, Humble Pie. Charlie Hoon did the Steve Marriott vocals. Charlie had played with Ted Nugent and Wally Stalker, who had uh, of the Babies, and um, it was was the second guitarist, and and Anthony Jones was the second Humble Pie bassist who replaced Greg Ridley. So I worked for them for 
you know, couple years, but at the same time I was playing in the witch hunters. So the witch hunters go on and playing with them for a while. We do the East coast tour with, uh, with the death of Samantha and, um, you know, the witch hunters were great. I loved playing with them. Wonderful people. I'm still dear friends with all of them, but they were just not that driven. And I was like, I really wanted to tour more and they all had day jobs and, right. and whatnot. But you know, you, uh, uh, I kept, sorry, I kept the, them going. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. But yeah, no, cause you hopped in the, with like when they were hitting like touring. Right. But their first show was at the fantasy with death of Samantha. Were you playing with death of Samantha at that time? Uh, no, I let okay. let's see that I'm leading up to that. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I the story of my life is I'm always kind of like a day late and a dollar short. <laughs> like for example, uh, Porta Hempo, or for example, with the Liars, I was their ninth, their ninth. Fuck. Basis. Okay, so they have enough ex members of the Liars to populate a small town. So uh, I was just one of them. I was their ninth bassist, and uh, it was a promise as a promise tour with the Witch Hunters. I was their third bassist. Okay, so uh, I, I it was it was Li- Liar Matic was the first one right. who played with them for their first few years. Jeff Erwick, who's still with them, uh, had left for a bit because he'd had children and had a serious job. So I joined when Jeff left. And I played with them from 89 to about 1990. And then I, I got a call from John Petkovic from Death of Samantha because they had broken up and then reformed. And John asked me to originally to be the guitarist and replace Doug Gillard, which I thought was insane because, you know, I'm, I'm not Doug Gillard and Doug Gillard's amazing. Uh, but, you know, I, I started to do some guitar stuff with them and then Doug came back and I'm like, well, please take the guitar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I became their bassist, you know, and, and I was happy with that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I played with them for from 1990 till about 1992, and during that time we recorded an amazing record with Sean Bevan from Nine Inch Nails, uh, who was the sound man from Nine Inch Nails. But it sadly has never been released and is uh, you know just gathering dust on a shelf somewhere in Parma, I think. But uh, but needless to say, I had a great time playing with them, and I'm still dear friends with them. The, the whole Death of Samantha thing was just, once again, I, w- I was their third bassist. It was bad timing. They'd broken up and reformed. And I, when I joined them, there was every hope that we would be, um, you know, doing more stuff. And what had happened is we did do some shows. We'd go up to New York. We didn't want to do anything that was like, first of all, we didn't want to beat a dead horse and play the Cleveland scene because they'd already done that for, right. you know, 10, 10 years previous. So it didn't make a lot of sense. So we were doing showcases in New York and whatnot. We went up and opened up for the Afghan wigs and like blew them off stage. And they, they were drunk and fucked up. This was at CBGB's and we blew them off stage and they got signed to Electra and we, we got signed to history. <laughs> and it was a drag, that is but a- you know, such is life. Um, so I, I, what happened during the time with Death of Samantha is, is in March of 1990, a friend of mine had taken over the job as the tour manager for Nine Inch Nails. And um, he said he needed to go to Atlanta to do some business for Nine Inch Nails. And they were looking to hire a technician to go out on the road with them and maybe, you know, uh, to work with them because they were starting to blow up. And I do mean really blow up. Right. So, um, so I tour managed them and I drove Nine Inch Nails up to Chicago for the head like a whole video shoot. So uh, we got, you know, I picked up the van and the van and the gear and drove them up there. And we went over to Martin Atkins's house and then raided his uh, drum closet and dragged all of his stuff down to the exit lounge in Chicago. And uh, we shot the head like a whole video. And I was the production assistant on that and uh, uh, ran the smoke machine and uh, helped the pick Trent up back up and dust him off and rehang him upside down, which they did as one of the point of view shots. You know, I'd, I'd, they'd, they'd, they'd lift him up by his feet. And he was swinging. There's a point of view shot at the end where he's writhing around and he, they drop him back down on this thing. He's hung up. He was hung upside down from this Thunderdome looking contraption over the exit lounge uh, dance floor. And uh, I helped lower him back down. And then we shot the video with this company called H gun, this guy, Eric Zimmerman directed. And that video just like fucking blew up, man. It was like, boom. And so I started touring with nine inch nails in March of towards the end of March of 1990, we went out and did the East or the West coast. And then we did the entire U S over that summer with me Beat manifesto and die Warsaw. And then we toured again in the fall of 1991 or 90 into 91. It was like 
December of 1990 into, into January and February of 1991. And during this time, I was doing sporadic gigs with Death of Samantha, and we were writing more material and trying to get things happening because we had recorded this. We hadn't quite recorded the album yet. That happened in the spring of 1991. So uh, around 19, in December of 1990, when Nine Inch Nails started their big theater arena tour for, the, it was called the Sin Tour. This was still on Pretty Hate Machine. Uh, Trent okay. asked me and Fritz, our monitor engineer, to be backup auxiliary guitarists with Nine Inch Nails. So we came out and played guitar and had like a hole, gave it that extra oomph, you know. Full sound. So I, I started doing that, and that was just sort of my ticket. And the head like a hole became my ticket to playing with Nine Inch Nails. So I was never a band member. I never claimed to be, but I got to play live guitar with them, which was amazing. So I did that for that two months on that tour. And then uh, once the nails got off the road in, in about uh, the end of February, we'd gone out and played some dates with Jane's Addiction. Trent calls me and said, hey, we're going to do this Lollapalooza tour in the summer. And it's going to be amazing. We'll do a 45-minute set. It will be done. It'll be great. It'll, you know, hangout party. It'll be amazing. I'm like, okay, awesome. So that was on the docket. So in about April of 91, Death of Samantha went into the right track, or it was Midtown Studios, Midtown okay. Recording. And that was with Bart Coster's place. I, I think that was the name of it. I, I'm so like, I've recorded at so many studios, I can never fucking remember everyone. So we go in, we record this stuff with Sean Bevan. We make this amazing record, Death of Samantha Does. It was paid for and it was shopped with a number of record labels and nobody picked it up because we made this amazing, like sort of timeless uh, art rock piece. It almost like, it's like Roxy music meets like punk rock kind of, it's hard to describe. It's very... It, but it it predated grunge, but it was almost like glam rock, you know, meets yeah. like punk rock, meets like um, it's 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 just it's such a timeless piece. It's hard to explain. So that we we put that on hold after I mean not we didn't put it on hold. We we did the record, and then Sean and I went out on the Lollapalooza tour and did that entire tour with you know Butthole Surfers and Nine Inch Nails crew shared a tour bus with the Rollins band. Right. Well, so how, we're out on. The, on what? that, what was it like? What was it like sharing a bus with those guys? Oh, they were great. They were great. They loved us. I mean, because they knew how hard we worked, and that was kind of a rough time for us with Nine Inch Nails because none, of, no one had been on that level before. I mean, here we go from you know clubs playing like you know two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand seaters to playing forty, fifty, yeah. sixty thousand large in a field, you know, and somewhere. And so we're playing these enormous places, and nobody had been on that scale it was the exception of jane's addiction who'd done like reading festival in europe and stuff like that but uh so with nine inch nails we had reached this sort of peak where we're like you know blowing up huge blowing people off the stage and but all that we've been using the same gear that trent had smashed time and time again and we had rebuilt as his crew and put it out on stage so shit was failing left and right you know on the entire tour and it was it was uh it was rough at times. Like we didn't plan ahead like a whole till almost mid tour because there was just so much problem with the gear. Fuck. And Trent was Trent was suing his label as a, uh, um, a TVT records to get off of the label. So we didn't have a lot of money for right. guitars and so shit. You, you know, had which to make was it smashing. work. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I was going out. The tour manager would give me like a couple of grand. I'd run out to you know. This was keep in mind. This is pre-internet. Right. And this right. is pre uh, cell phone. You know that we're used to so I'd, I'd get a day off and then i'd go i'd, I'd go to uh I'd, I'd take um i'd have a day off i'd take a um uh like we'd rent a car and then i'd i'd go to uh i'd find you know i'd call somebody from the hotel room on on the hotel phone you know it cost a fortune and i'd call up these like uh pawn shops and music stores and i'd be like you know, how many like uh, heavy metal guitars do you have? Like, you know, Trent needed a distorted sound. So right, we'd right. be buying like Charvel Jacksons and Schecters and, and um, y you know, any kind of guitar that had like a super DiMarzio, super distortion in it, you know, that kind of shit. So I could, you now keep in mind, this was the end of the 90s or the beginning of the 90s and all those hair metal bands that sort of died a slow death. So everybody pawned their, right. their metal guitars, their super strats as they're called. So I could go into a pawn shop and, and get five or six of those hand the guy a couple of grand and just walk out of there. And so I'd have like five or six Schecters or whatever. And, and, uh, and, you know, just, just the craziest fucking guitars, Jackson, Charvettes, Charvels, 
and I take them back to the venue. Sometimes I wouldn't even restring them. I just like tune them up and have them in these guitar racks. And then people would come up to me during the set and they'd be like, Mark, you I want to smash your guitar. Like Ice T would come up to me and I'd be like, Yo, but Ice Man, it's the last one I have. You know, I can't let you smash. And like John Mall, you know, Trent's manager at the time would be like, Mark, you give Ice T a guitar. And I'd be like, Oh, okay. And I'd go over there, I hand Ice T a guitar. And he'd, he'd go out on stage, like, blank, blank, blank. I wouldn't even plug it in. Smash, you know, <laughs> he'd smash the thing. I'd go out there with the trash can. I'd put the shit in the trash can drag it back over to my workstation and that went on for like months you know right so, so the whole Lollapalooza tour was just insane like that so um so we, you know we did that for uh we did that all through the Lollapalooza tour and then we went over to Europe and played with Guns N' Roses and um and did a, a whole headline tour the same kind of stuff you know having to find Trent guitars on a on a daily basis you know and it was just insane and uh, you might have seen my post about that that Gibson Explorer and that or, or uh, the Gibson Firebird, and and that that led from uh, what happened was we left we left Orlando it was the last one there was three more dates left on Lollapalooza but we left in Orlando flew to Europe to play with Guns N' Roses in Mannheim Germany well that last show in Orlando Trent smashed his two Gibson Explorers Fuck. and I didn't have any guitars when we went to Germany and I landed over there and had never been to Europe before didn't speak a lick of German so I ended up uh, once again getting a couple of grand from the tour manager uh, I asked the the promoter for a runner, and the runner took me to an hour away to a to a music store in Hamburg. And I asked the guy, "Do you have any Gibson Explorers?" Because that's what Trent was playing. And the guy goes in the back, you know, gives me the wait it wait here thing. Comes right. and back out with a couple of huge cases, and there's like a Gibson Explorer in one. Only it's a copy. It's a copy of a beautiful copy of Gibson Explorer. And then the other one is this Gibson Firebird signed by Rory Gallagher, the blues. Legend. Right, right. So I'm like, holy shit, you know, and I'm like, OK, how much for both? And he's like, you know, 2000 Deutschmarks. I'm like, here, hand him the money, get in the car, drive back to the venue, put the shit in the, you know, tune them up, make sure they're OK. They play all right. I, I mean, I'd done that before I left the store, but I'm saying right. I got to the venue, made sure they worked out. Everything was good with the gear, put them in the coffin case and came back the next day. So we're playing with Guns N' Roses, you know, we go out, we play six songs. There's like from the stage to the horizon, there's people in front of us as far as I can see, you know, largest, probably 100,000 strong, if not more, in this giant field in Mannheim, Germany. And, for, and we're set up in front of Guns N' Roses. Our gear looked puny in front of theirs. It's just insane. And um, so in uh, Nine Inch Nails record had not been released in Germany. So there's shit flying everywhere. You know, they're throwing shit at us. And, you know, Trent's like, no, you shot motherfucker. He's yelling at the crowd. <laughs> and, he, and he says to me, he's like, you're going to be out there, right? And I'm like, yeah, like, meaning like, I'm going to play guitar to head like a hole. So uh, we go out and, you know, uh, we play. We're almost to head like a hole. I, I grab the, the, the Firebird and I start playing that. And, um, and we get through head like a hole. And then Trent takes the beautiful Gibson copy that right. the, the Aztec Explorer throws it up in the air and it comes down and it lands on, it gets the headstock gets caught in guns and roses staging and the headstock snaps clean off. And I'm like, oh. Oh. So I'm like, Jesus, I got to find him another guitar. So we go to Cologne, Germany after a riot because Axl Rose was late right. uh, doing the show. So there, of course there's a riot. We, we get out just in time. We get to Cologne, Germany, but the gig for some reason was canceled. So we go on to Wembley in England. And uh, fortunately, Trent had bought an Explorer that day. Uh, so we, we, we used that new Explorer and played with Guns N' Roses at Wembley Stadium. And Trent had learned that particular day that um, he wasn't going to be able to get out of the record deal with TVT Records. So he was really upset. So he smashed the, the brand new Gibson Explorer that he just bought on, on Jeff, the late Jeff Ward's drum riser. And uh, I, needless to say, put it back in its case like I did the Aztec the day or two before and sent it back to the States, you know, at the end of the tour. It, it rolled around in a truck being broken. And then and, and I later fixed it, which is another story entirely. But uh, so uh, yeah, there's got to be a I, lot of good I, parts. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's exactly what happened. Is I all the broken guitars from Lollapalooza in Europe and stuff. I took all that shit home and then stripped out all the parts and made a bunch of Frankenstein'ers out Sick. of them. Sick. So I, I have all these amazing like Frankenstein guitars made from pieces and parts of Lollapalooza guitars, and I've got the I've got the Explorers fixed up. So it's pretty neat, really. Um, 
but I spent the rest of the European tour trying to get guitars that were like Explorers, so Trent wouldn't smash the uh, the uh, the Gibson Firebird, which was the '76 Firebird signed Sorry, by Rory yeah. Gallagher. So, needless to say, I took that home at the end of the tour because I didn't want to smash it. And years later, when I was with the Jim Rose Circus on the Downward Spiral tour when we were opening for them, Trent asked me, "He's like, whatever happened to that guitar?" And I said, "I took it home because I didn't want you to smash it." And he goes, "Well, just keep it, you know." <laughs> Because, you know, had he asked, I would have given it back to him. Right. It wasn't like I was trying to take guitars from him. I'd given him back. As a matter of fact, over the years, I did give him a couple back. Uh, you know, but I mean, he, you know, he didn't need them. Zombie he guitars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I gave him a few zombie guitars. And then there was, uh, and Richard Patrick, too. You see, I thought when we got back from Europe at the end of the Nine Inch Nails tour, I thought we were going to go back out. So I took like 20 broken guitars home and fixed them. You know, and years later, after Richard Patrick had left Nine Inch Nails and came through town with Filter, um, I told a friend of mine who was a mutual friend, I said, tell Richard I have some of his guitars. I want to give them back to him. And uh, Richard was playing in Berea with Filter at uh, Baldwin Wallace College. So I went over there and I, I gave him his guitars back and he was like thrilled. So that was, that was kind of cool. <laughs> he, even, awesome. he, even gave one, he even gave one back to me, this pink one, this pink like super strat, a Fender super strat. He gave back to me and signed it, you know, back in the day, Richard Patrick, he gave that back to me, which was really nice of him. So, <laughs> so, so cool. it's just, just funny, crazy how that shit works. So, all right. So that's the long and the short of Nine Inch Nails. So, uh, so we're 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 going on. It's it's you know Nine Inch Nails sort of ended and and then not ended, but they stopped touring. Once right. I did the broke broken and fixed EP, and they moved out. I think they went to New Orleans and then L.A. and then they stayed in L.A. during that time, and and that was pretty much his, the beginning of his L.A. foray. And then I went and it went right out with the band Die Warsaw from Chicago because they'd opened for us, and they wanted me to tour with them. So uh, I went out on the road with them and Bob Henning, the former lighting director of Nine Inch Nails, and Chris Brenna, the drummer from Nine Inch Nails early days, had, had started playing with Di Warsaw. So he was on the tour as well. So we started going out on the big electric metal, metal bass phase tour, and I became their production manager, uh, sole, sole stage technician, and their bassist. I started playing bass live with them, so that was cool. And I, I was see. also the one of their dancers. <laughs> we had angle grinders, and we used to grind them on these 55-gallon drums and spray the audience with, like, angle grinder sparks. So I would dance shirtless with Jackie O glasses on, you know? And, and like, uh, you know, if, and if you know me, you know how scary that is because I'm like a huge guy shirtless dancing on stage with an angle grinder and Jackie Onassis sunglasses. It was a great sight to behold. <laughs> so it was funny because me, well, me and John Shy, the, 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 one of the other technicians, he was the other dancer. And he, he it was so hilarious, too, because the two of us are on either side of the stage, like carving up these 55-gallon oil drums and spraying the crowd with sparks. It was sick. <laughs> so... So I did that through December of 91, came back, and then Ministry called me, and they're like, hey, we're going out on the second Lollapalooza tour, you know, why don't you come join us? So I joined Ministry and did the second Lollapalooza tour with them, and that was crazy, too, because uh, I'd been playing with Death of Samantha up through that point. We were doing, that's 92 in the spring, right before I went out with Ministry, we went up to CBGB's, and that's when we did that that gig with... um, uh, um, whatever the fuck uh the afghan wigs and we blew them off stage like i said right and um and then death of samantha we didn't really play much after that they, we kind of like fell by the wayside i think we attempted one more recording session and then the john put the whole thing to bed and then they formed cobra verde and mm, i can't okay. blame them because it's like you know they they were kind of waiting around for me and i was kind of waiting around for them and I think that John wasn't really happy with the end result of the recorded product or whatever. And they moved on, you know, and they, they formed uh, Cobra Verde, which is fine. You know, it was a Swan, Dave Swanson came back and was playing with them and it was sort of a mini uh, death of Samantha reunion with those guys. So, well, you know, I totally, and I, I, you know, I, I was busy doing stuff and touring the world and, uh, you know, now granted, I was still shopping the death of Samantha stuff when I was out on the first Lollapalooza tour, I met Hugo Burnham, the drummer from, uh, um gang of four he was henry right. rollins the day and our guy at imago records and that was one of the benefits of touring with henry is he knew everybody and everybody right. i met i met everybody on those Lollapalooza tours i mean it was like um i the funny thing is about the first Lollapalooza tours and the secret of it is nobody stayed at the same hotels everybody stayed at different hotels on the first Lollapalooza tour nine inch nails crew shared the bus with rollins band but we shared a travel agent 
with butthole surfers. So we were always at the same hotel together. So I partied with the butthole surfers every goddamn day That's on that awesome. tour. It was insane. So they were like, Marky, if we had, no, I've known the butthole surfers, a little back note here. I've known the butthole surfers since 87 when Death on a Stick opened for them at the Newport and Columbus on the Locust Abortion Technician Tour. And so that was like the height of my indie career in Northeast Ohio is when we opened for Butthole Surfers. But I became friends with them that night. And then when I, I, saw, I hooked up with them again on the Lollapalooza Tour, we became fast friends again. And they were like, if we're ever going to hire somebody, we're going to hire you. And they were true to their word. So nice. Yeah, because then you met up with them later. After exactly. Kicking so, it with them. Just crazy. So I, I go out with ministry. We're on the second Lollapalooza tour, and I became fast friends with everybody on that tour. And as a matter of fact, the Pearl Jam guys used to do a cover of Sonic Reducer by the Dead Boys. And I'm right. like, hey, I knew Stiv. I'm from Cleveland. And they're like, why don't you sing backups on it? So I started singing backups with Pearl Jam on Sonic Reducer. I'm working for ministry, watching Soundgarden every day, and then Eddie Vedder starts singing on Outshined with Soundgarden, and they invited me to sing with him, so I started singing backups on Outshine with Soundgarden. So I, you know, I became really good friends with those guys. Yeah. And the and the Pearl Jam guys, I'm still friends with all those guys. And um, so we did the Lollapalooza tour ministry did, which was just amazing. I played guitar with ministry on Stigmata a few times. So I got to play with them live. And then we did Europe with Helmet. And then we came back to the oh, States, sick. started that tour. And uh, and th those were all insane, you know, just the dates and everything. I mean, it, it's kind of a blur because we went from Lollapalooza right to Europe, a European tour, came right back to the States and started touring the States. I did that for a bit. And then... Uh, and, you know, that bled into 93. And in the spring of 93, the butthole surfers called. And uh, they're like, you know, hey, we're going on. We got this independent worm saloon record coming out. And uh, we'd like you to be a technician, but we want you to play with us, too. And I'm like, Sick. awesome. So, exactly. So, um, I, I go on and I tour with butthole surfers. And our first big tour was we did a few warm up dates. We did some dates with Pearl Jam and some other things. But then we went out with um, Stone Temple Pilots and did, uh, you know, that whole summer tour with right. Stone Temple Pilots and Fire Hose and Bass Head. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Watt and George from uh, from the Minutemen. Minutemen. Yeah. And and ironically, I had known the Minutemen. The Minutemen stayed at my house no shit. in 1985 on the Double Nickels on the Dog tour when they played in Cleveland. No way. They, I put I put them up, so they were they were old friends. I'd known them since then. I'm thanked on the back of the Project Mercy P. There's nice. those guys in yeah. Cleveland. <laughs> no shit. I'm, oh, that's so. Watt's like one of the coolest guys ever. Me, yeah, uh, he really is. Me he and really my bass is. player going to be talking with him tomorrow for his radio show, the Pedro show. Fucking oh, cool. Yeah, what's up? that's crazy. That's crazy. I, the Project Merch record, I I like it. I know it's it's way different. Oh than, yeah, it's such a cool no, I, record. No, it was it was wonderful to tour with those guys. George and Mike are wonderful people. They really are. You know, I mean, uh, the the it, that was it was it was just you know. Now keep in mind, everybody loved the Butthole Surfers, so right. to be able to play with them was like a dream come true and like everybody came to their gigs like we'd be in new york and like there's jim jarmusch there's no you know uh there's like you know every new york actor good that was friends with johnny depp you know you'd see people like that sonic youth you know everybody'd be backstage so you know we yeah we and, and you know even on the Lollapalooza tour everybody came out and was talking to butthole surfers i mean they just did so it was like i i befriended river phoenix through them you know, River was the sweetest guy. You know, he was just the nicest cat. And that was so tragic when he passed away because right. he just, he was like, had so much promise and just was a wonderful guy. But I mean, that's, that's just case in point is like everybody to this day still loves butthole surfers. I mean, I'm still friends with them. They're still family to me. You know, I love them dearly. Um, so we went so out and cool. did that tour and we played with everybody. I mean, that was the one thing is the butthole surfers, man, like, everybody wanted to tour or play with us on that particular year. So we did, we did the Stone Temple Pilots tour, which was called the Barbecue Mitzvah tour, but, <laughs> but both bands hated that name. So nobody rarely used it, but it's on a few shirts. Um, and Butthole Surfers were, the surfers were touring on the independent worm saloon record, but the right. tour was called the Barbecue Mitzvah tour. It was just weird. And <laughs> Stone Temple sense. Pilots were amazing. And Scott, Scott White Whelan was from orange, you know, just over right. by chagrin, you know? Right. So, 
I mean, another local cat. No, I never knew him. I have some friends who went to school with him around here, but that was just more crazy local shit. You know, everybody comes out of Cleveland or has an Ohio tie. It's weird. So, it's weird. I know. So we, we left there, that tour, flew over to England and played the Reading Festival and Poco Pop, and we actually shared a tour bus on that particular, those particular gigs with Stone Temple Pilots, which was great. And I befriended those guys and loved them to death. They're just wonderful, amazing people, great songwriters. And tragically, Scott's life was yeah. cut short, and you know, through various means. But it's it's sad. But he was another really gifted guy. But the DeLeo brothers and Eric, you know, uh, they're amazing songwriters. Robert and, and Dean DeLeo are two underrated, you know, writers and performers. I mean. They they wrote some perfect pop songs. I mean, inter, internet, Interstate Love Song is like the perfect right. example of how to write a pop song. That's a great fucking song. And uh, and a lot of their other songs are just like that. I mean, Dean DeLeo is a fabulous guitar player. Just really great. And Robert DeLeo is an amazing bassist and songwriter. I mean, he wrote a lot of songs for other people that people don't even know about. He was for, like a ghostwriter for Aerosmith and all oh, sorts shit. of shit. I mean, huh. yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a, they're great guys, man. They really are good, good people. Um, so anyways, after that, John, over to Europe, we came back and we went to Japan and played with Boredoms, which was incredible. We headlined a, a co-headliner tour with Boredoms in Japan for like a week. And it was the most amazing week of my life. And, uh, we came back and played Hawaii and then came back to the States. And I mean, obviously Hawaii's the States, but we came back yeah. to the main, the mainland and started, who did, what do we do? We did some more dates with. Well, we started a tour in the fall with the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, and that that kind of like went south real quick because neither band could agree on you know what was what, and there was d disagreements with the management. I mean, it was they were our special guests, but they thought it was a co-headliner, uh, okay. and they kept bitching about the stage arrangements. So we had a number of fallings out with them, and they left the tour after like a week, and right. we canceled the rest of that tour. But the year ended on a high note because we ended up getting Nirvana asked us to open their last. Well, we didn't know it was the last, but it was their last U.S. tour on the West Coast. So we went out and played all the, this was post-Christmas, it was December 28th through January, December 28th of 1993 through January 9th of uh, 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 um, 1994. So uh, we go over, or we, we go out to the West Coast and we played all those dates with Nirvana and it was just insane. And they loved us to death, they treated us so great. I mean, we're doing like, you know, the San Diego sports arena, which is like an enormous dome, you know, right. we did uh, the Oakland Coliseum. We did the LA forum, you know, and, uh, it, it was just fucking incredible. They loved us. I mean, they'd come to our dressing room and hang out and, you know, and, and we really got to know them and they just love, we had dinner with Pat Smear, the, oh, of the so germs cool. and Nirvana yeah, yeah. every night, you know, and, uh, they were just wonderful. Dave Grohl was just the sweetest guy is still the sweetest guy. And Kurt was nice. You know, I mean, Courtney was there. She was kind of high maintenance, but you know, it's Courtney love, you know, she does what she does. And, you right. know, and the little baby, little Francis Bean was a baby. God, it was, it was just incredible, you know? And, and, and Kurt, Kurt was really nice to me. You know, it's funny. It was, he was, he was, I can't say I knew him, you know, right. I talked to him a few times, but he was, he was nice. And, you know, last last conversation we had was we were talking he really wanted us to go to europe and play with them in europe and uh i said well hey let's get our managers together and talk about this because i'd love to do it but it obviously wasn't up to me and it didn't happen but um yeah butthole surfers we finished 93 or into 94 with them and uh that was that was just nuts man so we we ended in seattle at the key arena and that was it for uh nirvana in the states and butthole yeah. surfers on that tour that leg of that tour and um, it's funny because at the show in Seattle, I ran into Jim Rose, who was, uh, we became, Jim and I became fast friends on the second Lollapalooza tour because they headlined the B stage. Right. And then all the freaks from Jim's show used to come and watch uh, ministry. And Jim and I used to get high every day. We'd smoke dope with like Matt uh, from Soundgarden or whoever, Mike McCready from Pearl Jam. We'd all get high together and. You know, everybody smoked dope together on that tour. See, that's the funny thing. Yeah. On the second Lollapalooza tour, everybody stayed at the same hotel. So there's, you're, you're in a hotel with like 300 of your best friends. Right. And, and they actually had to advance the alcohol for <laughs> every hotel because we would drink every hotel bar dry and, and be up all damn night. It was crazy. It was just we we like closed every bar in every town and it was just nuts. So, all right. So uh, Jim Rose approaches me 
in, at the Se- last Seattle show with Nirvana and Butthole Surfers. They're like, what are you doing in two weeks? And I'm like, I actually didn't have anything lined up. So I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm looking for another gig. What do you got going on? He's like, I need a tour manager for uh, a Scandinavian tour. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so uh, I get a, a phone call and a ticket from his wife, BB, and she's like, there's a ticket for to Seattle at the airport, you know, fly out to Seattle. So I flew out to Seattle and then flew to Copenhagen. And we started a Jim Jim Rose uh, European tour. Actually, it was a Scandinavian tour. We played uh, uh, we, we played uh, uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and uh, Finland, and in the middle of the winter. <laughs> so there's like four, you know, barely four hours of sunlight. It's mostly right. twilight, and we're near the Arctic Circle. And I like crossed the Baltic in an icebreaker. <laughs> you know, ne- nearly got killed in a riot with Jim and company in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden. You know, I mean, when these two literal Vikings came in and started a riot in this club that was smaller than the old pop shop in Cleveland. I mean, it was insane. And uh, we were in Helsinki, Finland, and Jim was like. Hey, uh, you know, th- this is the last tour of the original circus. I'm, I'm putting together a new show. You, you want to perform in my new show? Cause Jim knew I was a musician and a right. frustrated one at that. So he's like, you know, could tour manage you play guitar and we'll, you know, we'll learn some stunts, you know, you can do some stuff in the show. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I come back to the States, you know, gather up my gear, move out to Seattle for a couple of months, you know, and we started, uh, I started training on a bed of blades, you know, I'd lay on a bed of swords and have a cinder block broken on my chest. And <laughs> I, I became the musical act with the enigma. Right. So the, the puzzle man, you know, and, and so, uh, we started a, a B club tour of Canada and, uh, in the U S now B club tour is like where you go to cut your chops. Right. So we went to Canada where nobody had known. Well, I shouldn't say that. Jim was actually well known in Canada because they toured the circus before they did Lollapalooza. They were touring Canada all the time through network. Uh, that would network was the company. It was a record label, but they're also a booking agency network booked him in Canada and William Morris agency booked him all the, all over the rest of the world. He was represented by John Brannigan, who's a total heavy at uh, William Morris agency. So uh, so we did all these club tours to kind of cut our teeth. You know, we're doing like uh, the Banffs, you know, and the, and the uh, I'm trying to think of the small, we, you know, the Edmonton, Albertas, the Regina, the Saskatoon kind of stuff, you know, right. uh, you know, the, the, the smaller venue, Tucson, anybody, that kind of stuff. So we cut our teeth doing that on a, on a month, several month long tour in the States. And then we fly to Australia and do a month of dates in Australia. And then we did a, a month's worth of dates. We flew from Australia right over to Edinburgh, Scotland, and we did the, the um, Edinburgh Fringe Festival for a month. And that was incredible. We headlined a circus tent uh, on this place called Calton Hill in, in Edinburgh during the Fringe Festival. If you're not familiar with the Fringe Festival, there's thousands and thousands of shows a day. Every, every club, every venue, anything that can be, be a venue right. becomes a venue and they put shows on for the month of August every year. So we, we did that. And we're just blowing out the door like gangbusters, sold out every night, six nights a week. And then uh, Trent Reznor called and he's like, hey, I want uh, the Jim Rose Circus to open for me on the Downward Spiral Tour, which he had just, you know, they just on Woodstock. Right. They started doing a club tour, cl- club tours, and then they started doing venues like Nautica and stuff. And that's when Marilyn Manson came in the picture and they started opening at Hole Open, a couple of those shows as well. So we fly to Muncie, Indiana from Edinburgh, Scotland, you know, and start opening for Nine Inch Nails on the Downward Spiral Tour, which was just insane. <laughs> so, right. uh, <laughs> we go and we do we go we go and we do that and Marilyn Manson is our opening act now, you know, and we did that for almost a year, you know, and it was just absolutely fucking insane because uh, you know, here we are, I'd come full circle, I'd worked for Trent, and now I'm opening for Trent, you know, and he he belovedly treated me and and that and all of us so well. Right. It was like meant, you know, we all the old you know, I mean, let's be honest. So when you work for people, it can be kind of hard, you know, and, and Trent's a perfectionist and rightfully so. I mean, he's per- got perfect pitch. He's an amazing, of, you know, award-winning songwriter and soundtrack, you know, designer. And he, he, the guy's incredibly talented and I have the utmost respect for him. And I really do. I really love the guy. And he was very kind to me because he, one, you know, shared the spotlight, let me play with his band. And, you know, I'll never say bad things about the guy because he was very generous with his fame and, and, on that tour, he just, you know, we, we, uh, 
on the Downward Spiral tour, we really became close again, and it was wonderful. And he asked me to play guitar and head like a hole again. And, nice. You know, and, and so I was doing that again, only at like, you know, your Boston Gardens, your Madison Square Gardens, and your, you know, here we are playing, you know, the largest venues that I've ever played in my life. I mean, other than the stadium tours of Europe and shit, but, you know, it's like every major basketball hockey arena in North America, including Canada, we were playing. And, you know, and Maryland Vance was opening for us. It was hilarious. So, um, so I did that for the better part of, you know, until the Downward Spiral tour ended and then I came home and then Jim was going back to Europe and I was kind of like, I'd been on the road for a while at that point. This is like 95 and, and right. I'll be honest. I mean, the non circus, stop. Had, it was nonstop and I'd been on the road since solid since 1988. So I was, I was kind of getting tired to a certain degree. So I, I, you know, Jim and I discussed it. He was going back to Europe because he had to do that to make payroll. Jim had to sell. T Jim didn't have a record label or tour support. They made their money through selling T-shirts mm. off the stage at the end of the show. That's how they made their money, made their payroll. So, you know, that and the guarantee of the ticket sales. Right. So, um, so what happened was uh, I decided to not, I, I bailed out of the circus and, you know, Jim and I are still friends. And, uh, and I decided I was going to start, uh, trying to play music on my own. So I went and uh, I recorded an album, shopped it around, and then this is where Mike Perkheiser comes back in a long-winded tale. But I call, Michael and I regained our friendship again because, uh, you know, I hadn't seen him since the Clampets were playing around town. And he was, you know, and they didn't play as frequently because everybody lived in different places. But um, – I'd recorded this album with a friend and then I needed somebody to mix it. So we called up Mike Perkheiser and he came over and he helped me mix a few songs and we renewed our friendship. You know, I got his phone, his current phone number and we talked and stuff. And then, you know, I, I even did John Latimer's uh, with Don, Don Dixon and I were keynote speakers at uh, John Latimer's Undercurrents Festival, music festival in Cleveland that year, the year like Rusted Root got signed and okay. all this other yeah. shit happened. And, and, um, Right around that time, Tom Bunch, the manager of the tour, the, the, the manager of the Toadies called me up and he's like, hey, I got this band that's starting to blow up real big. Uh, they need a tour manager. And I was like, I've been off the road and I made really good money as a tour manager and, and as a production manager and all my skill sets, you know. So it was like I hadn't been making a lot of money staying at home. So I was kind of like, well, I gave the I gave the solo thing a shot. It just wasn't the right time. So I'm like, what the hell? So I drove down to Columbus. My wife dropped me off with the toadies and, and uh, I hit it off with them. It was immediate, an immediate connection. So I, I became their, their tour manager and uh, did all the road management stuff. And then uh, long, you know, long story short, I ended up playing with them again. <laughs> I played guitar. They used to do 400 bucks by uh, the Reverend Horton Heat. So I'd sit in and play guitar with them in addition to tour manage them and, do all this other stuff. So I was with them for the better part of two years, like 95 into 96, we toured. Um, and we did, we did tours of Bush and the band hum. And, uh, the great thing about the toadies after those tours is with that, this is, this is where it gets really funny is we started doing these arena tours with, as an opener. So it's me and, and ironically, David Kerr, the sound man of guns and roses, oh, who I had met all those years yeah. ago in Europe. David became the sound man. But what happened was, is I took Danny Bassone out on the road with the toadies because what happened is Jim, our sound man, uh, who was out with the toadies when I joined them, Jim left. So I called Danny Bassone and Danny came out on the road for a couple of weeks, but he wasn't the right fit. Now that's not to say Danny couldn't do the job, but he really, he was out of his element. He was a bit over his head and he knew it. And, and so what happened was Tom Bunch called, I actually called Michael Perkheiser and was going to get Michael out on the road. Uh, because, uh, and, and what had happened is, uh, somebody had also called me and asked for a sound man and I recommended Michael and it was somebody, the monkeys, the band, the monkeys were looking for a sound man. So, uh, I recommended Michael and it, neither one of them worked out. Michael didn't work out for the toadies because Tom Bunch had called David care first and David okay. care came over from guns and roses and we're like, well, we can't really top that. Right. So, and right. he were David at the time really was like the best sound man in the world. He really was. I mean, and, and uh, he's since passed on and he was a dear friend and a great guy, but he was just, he was the He could make 
a bar band sound like Metallica in a fucking stadium. You know, I mean, he just was that amazing. And he worked for everybody. I mean, he'd worked for Bon Jovi. He'd worked for Metallica. Uh, every hair metal band he'd tour, Cinderella, Poison, he'd mix them. He knew their shit. Guns N' Roses for years. He was the best guy in the business. So David and I are out with, with uh, the Toadies. So Toadies go out on the road. We do all those band tours I was telling you about. Still touring on Rubberneck, doing MTV, you know, 120 minutes and shit like that. And we get a call from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and they're like, you know, they're touring on One Hot Minute. Dave Navarro's now the guitarist, and uh, and we go out and we do the West Coast with them. So we're doing dates with uh, the Toadies and Red Hot Chili Peppers touring the West Coast and shit. It was amazing. And then fucking uh, White Zombie calls, okay? And this oh, is shit. where the cramps the cramps come back right. into the picture here. So the White Zombie asks us to do these dates with uh, with them. So we do like two weeks of dates with them and it's like the lineup get this lineup it's it's the voluptuous horror of karen black toadies cramps and white zombie playing uh, like two weeks worth of west coast dates and midwest dates and it was just fucking incredible you know so i renewed my you know acquaintances i can't like once again lux and ivy were very private people right i can't say i knew them well but i renewed my acquaintances with them and i you know i i befriended them again and talked to them a bit you know and they were gracious as ever and of course they you know their lives had changed you know they'd gone from a rock and roll lifestyle to something a bit more like you know the rider now consisted of fine wine and cheese as opposed to like you know cold beer and what you know pot or whatever you know i you know not even saying that i, I don't yeah, even think just, they were ever pot it's getting pot classier in. exactly exactly so so we're doing these dates and it's just fucking amazing i mean so I, I would help their road crew like load the cramp stuff in the truck at the end of the show and you know befriended them again and was just like excited to be out with them but i mean every night voluptuous horror and karen black amazing toadies come out just slay and then the cramps come out and everybody comes out to watch them and they just killed i mean they just fucking killed every night i mean lux would be up there now all those years ago when they played the fantasy theater, Lux was still doing the same bit. Yeah. You know, they're doing Surf and Bird as the encore. He strips down to his panties. He's in those six inch <laughs> high heels, yeah. nothing else. Like the gold LeMay underwear and high heels. And he's like climbing the PA system. Now, this is all these years later. He's probably in his early 50s. He's like, I'm like 57 now. And Lux was probably in his like late 40s, early 50s. And he's like climbing the fucking PA. And and all these years later, this is in L.A. with White Zombie, not the not the Cleveland date, but yeah, he, yeah. He, you know, he did the same bit. So he climbs up the PA system, you know, and it's he, he's standing on the PA system in his Golden May underwear, his fucking six inch Hollywood Fredericks of Hollywood heels, downs a bottle of wine, has the microphone in his hand, the mic stand, and he jumps from the PA stack to mid stage, jumps, you know, lands on a PA. Lands on a lands on a monitor on set, downstage center stage, snaps the microphone stand in half, keeps singing, gets up, you know, half the mic stand falls in the pit. The other hand is the one is still taped to the mic, you know, and he's he's finishing surfing bird, like pours a whole bottle of wine down his neck, throws the thing down, and then like you know saunters off stage. And you're just like, oh my god, how the fuck did he do that and not kill himself? Right. I mean, one he could have impaled himself with a microphone stand. You know, the other, he's just, you're just like gobsmacked. Like, how the fuck did he not kill himself? And, you know, he's not bloodied or he's bruised, you know, but he's, I mean, it's Lux, you know, just, just amazing. So uh, we, you know, and the best thing is, is when we played this, that was at Irvine Meadows, the the late venue that's sadly no longer there. It's kind of like their blossom, you know, almost a concrete bunker, but it held like 17, 18,000 people. So that's at Irvine Meadows. It's Halloween. Alice Cooper and Elvira are the MCs at that show. And, and like white, you know, um, Rob Zombie's out like filming the show, right. you know, when the cramps played. And the cool thing is, is Rob Zombie, I saw him dive in the pit and he got the, uh, he got the one half of the microphone stand that, that Lux had smashed. He grabbed that. And I grabbed the other half that was still in the mic stand. So I have the other half of that microphone oh, stand sick. from Lux diving at, at that show. That's and, awesome. You know, and that, and that's the thing is, my entire career, I've picked up shit like that off the stage. So yeah. I have shit like that. I have two of Lux's mic stands, and then I have uh, 
you know, I have flowers from the heart shape box video from uh, when, when Butthole no Surfers toured with Nirvana. Right. Nirvana used the same flowers from the heart shape box video on their tour, and they'd fall off when the stagehands would move the shit. Right. And I, I would just pick it out of the trash, and they'd be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm preserving music history. And they thought I was nuts. Right. And I'm like, you know, and four months later, Kurt sadly was passed on. You know, it's like it's gone. So uh, then I have all these things still. That's so, so sick. Uh, so anyway, so I, I, I finished with the toadies, you know, and after we'd done this, these various tours, we did a tour that summer with um, Butthole Surfers, Super Suckers, and Reverend Horton Heat. And that was the, we went into the fall and then we ended in like Cleveland, uh, somewhere around the end of 1996. And, um, that was, uh, that was, I was done with the toadies at that point and got off the road a little bit after though. I, I went back out and did some one-offs with some other people and still continued to work at that time. But right after I got off the road, my father had a heart attack and my mom had, uh, my mom broke both of her ankles. My mom was diabetic and she slipped right. and fell, and broke her ankles. So I came back and ended up taking care of my parents. But that long extended stay at home, I got in touch with Michael Perkheiser again. And Michael was like, hey, I'm putting this band together called 3D. You know, would you like to be part of it? So I went down to the studio and started listening. And I was like, wow, this is great. You know, so I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, I want to do this. So I started playing with Michael and we we became fast friends again. And that 3D stuff turned out fantastic. Yeah. We made like three albums worth of amazing material, and and um, it was great. But you know, it was the end of the 20th century, and there was radio consolidation going on. There was label consolidation going on, and nobody seemed really interested in what we were doing. And both Michael and I were over 30, so to the music industry, we were we were old hat. We were washed up, so nobody kind of paid attention to that. So. Uh, but uh, during that time, in 1997, the Cramps came back to town, and um, Michael and I both went and worked for them. Uh, they came back to town and played a gig at the, uh, what is it, the uh, Armory, right in downtown Cleveland. They played the Armory there. It was for Camel Cigarettes. It was like hmm. a bartender's night, you know? Yeah. And Camel Cigarettes paid the Cramps like a shit ton of money to fly them in, pick up their expenses, rent their gear, and pay us. So Michael and I went and worked for them, and the, we... Uh, you know, hung out with the cramps and did their show and uh, they paid us well. And it was a wonderful time. And, uh, and that was the last time I worked for the cramps, but I got to, uh, you know, got to know him and see him again. And it was, it was wonderful, man. That was really, really incredible. And uh, it was a, just a wonderful experience again. And it was really cool to do Ivy and uh, a slim chances guitars. You know, right. I, I, that was, a, that was the first time I ever got to really, uh, tech for them you know i'd worked for them before low loaded and lugged their gear and did the little mini tour with them too but this is the first time i got to actually tech for ivy and she was just lovely you know every, everybody was just amazing and 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 lux did the same thing you know this the stage dive and i mean it, and and just it was just insane i mean they were so fucking good and so hugely influential and i mean everybody and everybody who was anybody was there you right. know at that one show in 97 and and I sadly missed their early dates, and even when they in, in the early two thousands, and I missed their shows at the at the Beachland and stuff like that. I miss those, but uh, you know, I've been friends with Michael, and I talk, you know, every couple weeks here, you know, and we we're we're still in touch, and you know, he's kind of the keeper of the the Cramps flame at the moment, you know, he and uh, Ivy's brother. Uh, I mean, there's there's Ivy is still you know, the cramps, she is right. still like the guardian of the cramps legacy, but she has retired from public life. And, uh, and, uh, you know, as far as I know, she's sort of, uh, drifted off into obscurity by her own doing, you know, right. and that's, that's for what I know, that's where it's at. And we, there's sort of, there's certain things we don't talk about in cramps lore, you know, knowing <laughs> the family, we just don't go any farther than that. You know, there's, right. there's secrets that she'll go with us to the grave, <laughs> you know, and that's just kind of how it is. And, you know, that's, that's why rock and roll is kind of mysterious. It needs to be, you know, right. everybody at this stage of their life is kind of self mythologizing. And, you know, I'm, I'm admittedly guilty of that, but I'm what everything I've told you is, is more or less true. You know, we may embellish, some of the the situations and the facts and stuff but they're true this shit really right. happened i mean and it's like you know and, and granted memory colors things differently you know and i'm sure if you could take you know 10 people from that those Lollapalooza tours and ask them their opinions and it's their opinion of what happened you know and right. it's like some people were there for those things some people heard about them some people witnessed them and i got to witness and participate in a lot of crazy 
shit and that was just some of it you know and i i didn't even do any like super deep dives into some of these things too because like there's just so much wacky shit that goes on in like any one tour i mean right i mean uh the toadies for example uh you know lisa from the toadies was just diagnosed with cancer so i'm praying she gets healthy you know she just got she just went through surgery and i'm praying she's all right you know she was like family to me the toady to, the two texas bands toadies and butthole surfers are like family i mean not saying those other bands aren't but they i'm still in touch with them i'm still friends with them and and when i see them we pick up right where we left off and that's the beauty of what we do in this industry there's people i haven't seen in 30 years, but I, I, I hook up with them on Facebook or they may come through on a tour when I work with them at Blossom. I'm a union stagehand at Blossom and, uh, and you know, with local 48 stagehands. So I do like the Civic and EJ Thomas and Blossom and other stuff, but I'm still a mercenary. I'm still, still carrying my rock and roll mercenary card, you know, and uh, people still call me, do this, do that, yeah. do this one off, do this thing. And, uh, you know, be a roadie for a day, do a festival, do a stage manage, sure, I, whatever, you know, just pay me. That's all I ask. <laughs> you know, give me credit and pay me. <laughs> well, you know? But to be, um, oh, sorry, I was, like, was going to say, like, to be in the headspace, to be able to handle all these different situations and just be like, all right, I'll figure that out. Like, that, uh, that's not, that, that that's some Rollins-esque shit. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, yeah. That's no, not you... like the normal person that that's gonna go out of their comfort zone into like from playing to managing. You know, just in any oh, degree, yeah. you get there's this whole slew of terms you gotta learn. And like, oh, this... and, and keep in mind, we were doing this stuff without computers, right. without cell phones. You know, uh, I mean, the bulk of my touring was done in the pre-internet days. You know, the bulk of my touring it was done without computers and without cell phones and without gps's and i mean we found shit by dead reckoning in an atlas you know i mean we we really did yeah. and, and we really you know when i say i was the everything guy for nine inch nails on the down on the on the pretty hate machine tour i was the everything guy i mean i drove the truck i set the gear up I teched for four people, you know, during the show. I also was stage security, the stage manager, the production manager. I packed the truck. I drove the truck. Uh, I, and I played with them, too, you know. I right. mean, you know, and, and granted, as we went up in time, some of my jobs lessened. Some of them became more intense. Right. You know, when I started, you know, moving up the food chain with various bands. I mean, with ministry, I was just the sole technician. Uh, but or not, I mean, I, I, I teched for three guys. The late Mike Scotia, uh, Sam Ladwag, and Al, Al uh, Jorgensen, you know. But we went over to Europe, and then it was like I had to. Add, we added in, uh, you know, uh, there was more guitars, and a, another guitarist came on board, and you know, there was just there, you had to adjust to certain things. And it's like with Toadies, with David Kerr and myself, we were two guys. David did the sound, and I did all the stage stuff. You know, and and uh, David and I did all the loading and unloading of all the gear, wrangling the stage hands, production managing, tour managing. David did the accounting. I did the tour management. Like I'd get the money, hand yeah. it to David. He had a he had like an early laptop with a good like I think it was Quicken program. So he did the math. Yeah. You know, and paid everybody after I, I had done it for a while, but I was still using like a calculator and a fucking microphone pouch to hold you know forty large. You know. Right. So it's 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 like. The shit we did, I mean, here we are, you know, some bands had like, you know, five or six or 10 people on their crew. And it's just me and David doing these like stadium shows, right. you know, and, and you're doing all the work, you know. Yeah. And even with, with Butthole Surfers on the world tours, it was me and the band and our tour manager, Murray. And that was it. And in Canada on the Nirvana tour, I was the tour manager, the travel agent. I did the immigration work shit, right. production manager, guitar tech, guitarist. You know, I did everything on the Canadian dates because Murray, our tour manager, had been busted for a joint like 10 years earlier and couldn't go into Canada because he, he was a New Zealander. And they wouldn't let him into Canada because the pot laws were so harsh. So it was just crazy. I mean, the shit we had to do. And, and yeah, we'd do it on the fly and we'd do it with like, uh, I mean, just, I mean, so many things happened that you'd be like, what the fuck, you know, what right. the hell, you know, I mean, uh, just, just insane, insane shit, you know, it is, God. 
just to be able to <laughs> learn it and be able to like pull it. Okay, we got to get it through the border today. I need to know all these things. We're carrying oh, yeah. all this merch. I need to be able to write off like we're not going to tax it or figure out how that works in here. Like, the, the, oh, learn yeah. all that shit oh, the, on the there, fly. Crossing borders was always the worst because, you know, pre, pre like with Jim Rose, we had to hand write out. You needed to go through. If you're going to Canada or even overseas, he had to put together what was either a carnet or a manifest. Or uh, uh, their manifest if you're going into uh, Canada, and their your their carnets if you're traveling anywhere in the rest of the world. And it basically, it's a list of your equipment. Well, we had handwritten notes for what all our equipment was. It has like the the country of origin, how much it costs, what it's worth, where it was made, and you'd have each individual item. And I mean, we had shit like Tesla's coil, handmade, Seattle, Washington, you know, $6,600 made for, it's worth a thousand, you know, yeah. bed of swords, you know, each handmade sword individually. And, you know, you'd have to write all that shit out, you know, it's crazy. And uh, one time we were trying to go into Canada with Jim Rose and we had a, we used to put scorpions. We had an emperor scorpion. We used to put it in Enigma's mouth during the show. And we were trying to smuggle it into Canada. And uh, we hit it in the, in the deep, you know, depths of the tour bus. And they found it. And they didn't give a shit about the scorpion. They were more pissed off that we tried to smuggle in T-shirts and not declare the T-shirts, you right. know, because that's how we made our money. And they're like, well, you can only take 125 T-shirts in there for promotion, meaning we had to give them away. So we're like, right. yeah, okay, fine. So we took those in and they sold out like a New York second. And we were pissed off because we could have made more money, but we didn't. And it was all because we didn't want to pay duty on, you know, the, yeah, uh, two, th- you know 200 it. or 300 T-shirts or some shit, you know, so... Just, just crazy stuff like that, you know. That's, I mean, God, it's so uh, cool though. It just, know. it that's it takes such a, a mindset to be able to handle that and like to be able to like learn all that on the fly and keep going with the punches as they come. And like as as long as you hit the road nonstop, doing all these different things, it's so. It's like when I uh, reached out to you, I started looking into your career, and it's so manic. <laughs> you know, I was oh, like, this is absolutely. this is insane. And like, oh no. It, it really, it really, really is. And, and I can't, I, I'm glad you see it that way because it really was. I mean, I was so lucky. And that's why I say I'm like, it was like Forrest Gump meets Zelig. You know, I was fucking everywhere at every like historic turn of like grunge and punk rock coming overground. And, you know, and, and, and even back in the 80s, I mean, I was, I was part of that whole college rock with the terrible parade is, is case in point. It's like right. we were contemporaries of REM. We predated the Smiths and we were highly popular. We got great, you know, great uh, airplay on like college radio across the country, if not the world, you know, used to be able to follow that shit with things like the Gavin report, which are sadly no longer around, but we used to get great ratings on, you know, rock pool and college radio, uh, you know, media journal, uh, CMJ and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, we were, but technically we were kind of like almost also rands, even though we were completely, different than those bands we never got a leg up we never got a break and you know whereas bands like death of samantha you know john petkovic was really tied into homestead and he managed to get death of samantha a number of records out and that were you know internationally distributed and are highly sought after now and it's like and more power to them you know i mean i'm i'm, I'm happy for those guys and they had a good run but it's like they they kind of like us were kind of like you know um just sent to the pages of history, you know, and people revere us and they talk about us in, in good terms now, but you know, we never, uh, never made it per se, but you know, we had a good run and that's, that's cool. And, you know, I never fully made it. I'm, I'm known, you know, I'm a known figure. I'm, 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 you know, publicly known and whatnot, but, uh, and, but I had a good run. I don't, I'm not bitter about it. Uh, I mean, there was, there were certain things I wish could have turned out differently, but, uh, you know, you, you got to look at it like, you know, I'm still here. <laughs> right. I mean, if you're taking all the times I nearly bought the farm, it's like every day is a fucking gift at my age, you know? I mean, especially if you knew the copious amounts of like substances. I mean, I'm, I'm 17 years into sobriety, you know, and I quit drugs and alcohol awesome. in one day, cold Turkey, yeah. you know, and I was, I was doing enough opiates to kill an elephant. And, and seriously, literally, I was doing like enough opium to kill a fucking elephant Fuck. and it built, and built up a tolerance to the point that I was I didn't even feel it. I was constipated and angry, Fuck. <laughs> you know, was and, that... and with with alcohol, I was I could drink a fifth and not even put a buzz on. So my liver is like.
like yeah. my liver is like hanging on by a thread at this point, you know, so I'm, I'm lucky to be alive. And I, I think, you know, you know, you know, whatever, I, you know, whatever your religion of choice, I am not going to begrudge anybody the religion, but I'm just saying, I'm thankful I am still here. You know, that's all I'm going to say. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> what was there like a, was it, was this during touring? When you, when no, you, I okay, quit, so- I quit after my daughter was born. Gotcha. After my daughter was born, I, 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 what happened was I was working at Blossom Music Center as a stagehand, and I jumped off a wall, and I tore the arch of my foot, uh, yeah. my plantar fasciitis. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. And, and uh, it was like walking on a razor blade for the better part of two or three years. And um, I just could not, for the life of me, um, deal with it. And, and uh, now, granted, I'd, I'd done opiates since the 80s. I'd chipped on them. I, I'd always walked away and never got a habit until then. You know, and it was only after I got hooked on Vicodin with the pain mm. of my foot that I switched to Percocets and then got on uh, Oxy. This is when Oxy had just started to really take over the death throes of America, you know. So I got in when the get was good pre-fentanyl, right. you know, and I had I had all sorts of doctors who'd give me all sorts of opiates. And uh, I was just doing t- I was doing straight opium. I, I was doing I was doing um uh, uh, like two Oxycontin and straight morphine to kind of give to cancer patients and not even putting a buzz on, you know, and, and, uh, and it, it just, it, it, I, I got to the point where I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I woke up one day and I said, that's it. And I stopped and I went cold Turkey and I fucking made it through and, and I'm still here now. And, you know, fortunately I've been able to be here for my family and, you know, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that, you know, and, yeah. and, um, you know, during the early two thousands, when this happened, I started doing in 1999, uh, 3d broke up right around the end of 1999, but I bought a, uh, one of those boss loop stations, a guitar pedal. Yeah. Yeah. And Which I one? started doing the RC 30 uh, the, the RC 20. Yeah. Okay, the, 20. Yeah. Yeah. The original one. And I started now for years, I've been trying to do sound on sound, recording and like a one man kind of show with rhythm and stuff. Right. But those that's what those loop stations allowed me to do. So I started touring and doing that kind of stuff as, as this indie rock band, Iguana Don Ho, <laughs> <laughs> which was the sort of that was my sort of college uh, the, the kids will think it's indie rock, you know, this is me trying to be funny, you know. So I came up with a stupid name and just put out started, you know, doing that this this one man show. But I ended up uh, around that time Sonic bids had started doing like had come online and TuneCore, this other company had come online so I could get my songs out on iTunes. I started selling songs individually. I have a huge back catalog from all the bands. Right. And in that solo record I did with Mike Perkheiser back in the, in the, in the nineties. So I started like putting out songs and records on TuneCore. And then I started booking gigs at festivals through, um, um uh the other one i was just talking about uh, uh, um, uh sonic bids the, yeah sonic bids i'm sorry totally spaced uh sonic bids so uh, through that i got i ended up getting some gigs in canada th- and met this great guy named daryl hers who runs what's called indie week up in toronto so i went up and played a solo show up there as a wanted on home did that gig and i hit it off with daryl up there uh and uh he had, he, he too read my resume and was like, dude, you've done all this shit, you know, come on back. We'll have you back as a keynote, you know, next year. So I started going to Indie Week in Toronto for a few years and I, I keynoted and spoke up there and played up there and stuff. And, uh, you know, I was doing television and shit. So that, that was great. I was still kind of doing the music career and stuff. And, uh, it was, it was really, really awesome. So I, you know, I did the solo band thing for a while and, uh, in the early two thousands too, it, um, uh, the Enigma had left the Jim Rose Circus, so he and his wife Katzen came back, and and I ended up booking them in 2001 at uh, the Tower City Horror Fest. You know, Belkin put on a horror fest, and they had me put that together. So I, I put on a whole, um, you know, it was like haunted. They had haunted houses, and then they had a sideshow stage. So we did this shock. It was called Shocktoberfest. So the Enigma and Katzen and I did this Human Marvels Shocktoberfest, where we did four shows a night. It's Oktoberfest, and we opened for Alice Cooper, and we opened for Mushroom Head, and then we did four nights a week there, uh, uh, you know, four shows a night, uh, for the better part of October 2001. This was right after 9/11, so it was kind of poorly attended, but we still got to do some fun shows, and that was pretty neat. 
And uh, I continued on doing shows. I booked the Enigma and Katzen for a while. I actually managed them for a while. And then I started doing the solo shows more and more and booked myself around. And up through about 2007, I was doing the solo shows. And then uh, then I kind of stopped for a bit and, and just didn't really play as much. I joined a band called Pinky Mojo for a bit, played with them for a bit and did some recording, but that didn't amount to much. But uh, around that time, actually in early, I should backtrack a bit, in early 2001, I think it was May of 2001, right yeah. before uh, the, the, I did the Human Marvel thing in 9-11, I joined the Stagehands Union at, at Blossom and, okay. and started working with them. So that's when I became a union stagehand. And I apprenticed with them. And then I'm, I'm a journeyman now, but I apprenticed with them for a few years doing that. And uh, that was that was cool. But uh Let's see, around 2005, uh, a friend of mine was teaching at Tri-C, and he had been teaching a tour management class, and he had to go on sabbatical because he worked on old houses, so he went, He left town for six months, and he asked me to cover his class for him, so I went and started teaching at the Recording Arts and Technology Program at Tri-C in 2005, and um, I liked it so much. During that time, I wrote a whole production management class because they had just started that recording arts and technology program. Tommy Wiggins, right. our, our founding father, had, had started that up, and it was really coming into something. It was really great. So I managed to take my touring career and turn it into a lecturing career with you know all the stories and all yeah. the crazy things. So I, 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 I wrote out a bunch of lectures and production stuff, and I turned it into a book. And I published the Rock and Roll Mercenary book in 2019 or 2009. I'm sorry. So I put that out, and and then that became my class book. And I started a concert technical production in 2006 at Tri C, and we've been doing it ever since. So you know, beautiful. And uh, that's basically with the stage crew for the Beachland, and uh, I have sent hundreds of kids through that program, and they have ended up. Some of my students work for. One of them is Meek Mills, Future, and Meg, no Megan the Stallions, front of house engineer. Another one she works for, she's Trenor, Trevor Noah from The Daily Show. She's his monitor engineer. No um, other students work for The Who. Some work yeah. for Widespread Panic. Some work for Jay-Z and Beyonce. Some have worked for uh, Ryan Adams. I mean, uh, so I have all these students who work at the largest sound company in the world, which is eighth day but they just got bought out by claire global so now they all work under the claire global umbrella and now they're the largest sound company in the world but all my former students that work there now work for claire global and it's great that's so sick that's, yeah that's so, so I, cool I, they sorry sorry uh, no i'm just saying it's so i have students that are touring the world and have taken over for me now so i absolutely have a lineage of these former students that are like my bre my my children, you know, <laughs> that are going on and doing this stuff, and and they're like my kids, man. I, I, I you know, I've talked them off the ledge at three a.m. when they're half a world away. I've you know mentored them and dealt with them, watched them have kids and stuff. It's it's amazing, you know. It's it's wild, you know. The new breed of so, mercenaries. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You that know? has so, to, that well one to be in that position where during like being across the world and trying to handle all this madness and to be able to call someone and be like, what do I do? Like, oh, about, yeah. I don't, I don't oh, know if yeah. you had someone like that when you were doing this, but to have someone like that would have changed well, the game. I would imagine. I, I was lucky. I always had a lot of good friends and I had a lot of good people on the road. Uh, I did. I mean, fortunately my parents were still alive when I was, you know, if I ever really had a bad problem, I could always call home, you know, and they were right. always very supportive. Um, you know, but yeah, I also had a lot of good friends. And one thing too, is I, I'd done some traveling going back to the liars tour, you know, when I went back to the liars tour, I had friends in all these cities that I made, you know, and then I had some of my best friends from Cleveland and beyond and moved to desperate parts of the U S and other parts of the world. So Pretty much in every city, you had a network of somebody to hang out with or sleep on their floor or visit with. And right. especially on the West Coast and the East Coast in New York, I'd call people up, hey, what's going on? And I'd see old friends. And like I said, it's, it's a great thing about music here. Even, you know, I'm sure it's true with uh, people that go through wars and stuff like that. You pick up with your buddies right where you left off, you know, right. male or female. You had friends in different cities and, 
you know, and, and that's, that's the beauty of what we do and, and how we do it. And yeah, there, there were people that you could call and say, Hey, I'm having a rough time or, or whatever, you know, and, and, uh, and I've tried to provide that service for my, my students and yeah, I've, it's above my pay grade, but that's okay. Cause just knowing that you've helped somebody a little farther down the road, that's a, a nice feeling to know that you've, you've been counseled to somebody or you've, you've managed to help them feel better or right. just survive, you know, cause you know, if the shoe were on the other foot, you'd want somebody to be there for you. So you do it, you know, and it's, it's a, it's very satisfying. It's very satisfying to see my students go on to such great success. And it's like, you know, and sometimes they'll come back and they'll be like, man, I owe this all to you. And I'll be like, man, I only opened the door. You walked through it. You did all the hard work. You know, I just showed you a path. And that's kind of what I do with the students is I, I tell them, it's like, look, you know, it's like, you know, there are many paths you can go back, <laughs> you know, to quote Led Zeppelin. But I mean, it's true. There there are many paths and many jobs you can do in the music industry. I basically open the doors for them and say, what do you want to do? And then they say, I wanted to be a tour manager. OK, well, we'll focus on this. I want to be a musician, but I want my career to take off. OK, well, here, let's focus on this. You know, what can I do to get down farther down the road? You know, and I help them with everything from what to put on their business card to what to put on their resume to what to what to tell people in negotiation for money to, you know, because uh, I mean, it's it's a it's the Wild West out there. And you, you do have to have street smarts and, and and skills to negotiate this stuff. I mean, you know, there are ripoff artists in any sort of job. But I mean, the music industry is, you know, <laughs> snakes and crazy people and <laughs> drug addled, you know, right. crazy motherfuckers, you know. <laughs> And those are, and those are just the musicians. I mean, it's like you know, you know. Those no, are the I guys mean, uh, put it on the show. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 nuts. I mean, there's so many things, and you know, th there were you know, I, there were a lot of amazing times, and, and there were bad times too. But for the most part, you know, in retrospect, you tend to remember the good shit. You know, right. that's why I'm not embittered about it. I'm I'm lucky I got to do that shit. You know, very lucky, and I, I'm grateful for my experiences. And you know, and it's it's really it's cool. It's cool to sit here and talk to you about this and just say, Hey, this is what I did. And it was neat. You know, it was great. And I love telling stories about the shit. Cause uh, I mean, there's countless stories. You could just, I could just go on and on. And, and, and even with the Cleveland shit, it's like, there's so many great, um, there's so many great old punks and punk stories and funny people and just people that were way ahead of their time. And in Northeast Ohio, especially, you know, accurate, I, I was fortunate because I, I was, a a product of, of the Cleveland, Kent and Akron scene. You got know, I got all. to play in yeah. all the scenes, you know, a lot of people were just isolated. They played Cleveland or they played Kent or they did Akron. You know, I, I got to hang out and know everybody in all three scenes, you know, and I'm, I, I consider myself very fortunate. I mean, you know, just to be able to still sit in with the Clampets or like, right. you know, I, I become, I become dear friends with Robert Kidney of the numbers band. Nice. And it's like, you want to talk about legend. You know, I know I, I've played the world over with some very famous people, but I have sat in with the numbers band and I, I consider that to be one of the greatest honors of my extensive career. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, because it's like Robert Kidney to me is like you or I seeing Howlin' Wolf for Muddy Waters in Chicago in the 50s. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, R Robert Kidney is that iconic, you know, in my life. And the fact that I've been invited to sit in with them and play guitar with them is an incredible honor. And I don't take that shit lightly. I mean, Robert Kidney is like the voice and the heart and the soul of, of our scene. You know, he is our grandfather, our, 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 and, and I don't mean to age, sound ageist or anything. Cause I'm not, I mean, right. I, he is our, he is our, our founding father, I think would be a better term because he, everybody respects and and loves him and he is he is the real deal i mean right. he is a, a poet laureate i've sat in his kitchen and read the lyrics to his music and just wept you know i mean the guy he he's he's really something it's it's incredible and uh they are a band that is still playing and still performing even you know i mean granted they've played a couple shows during COVID. even yeah and you they know, just put out a new record Oh, and it's fabulous. It is. I, mean, that, so... I, I did a video for that song, Blue Collar. No shit. Off that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, check it out on my channel, Crazy Man 13. And 13 is spelled out. It's not numerical. Gotcha. gotcha. Crazy Man 13, one word. Uh, but yeah, there's and there's a lot of videos from my career on there. Look, 
the, on my playlist, it says my, uh, songs featuring Marky Ray. I dragged a few of those together. So there's like Butthole Surfers and Pearl Jam, me singing with those bands and playing with them and some Jim Rose shit and stuff too. It's crazy. It's so, yeah, I, I agree 100% with what you said with uh, Robert. I, I, yeah. Like the, the, and the numbers band, just that band birthed so many other bands that came out in oh, the yeah. scene. Like the Tin Huey came out of it, Devo came oh, out yeah. of it. And yeah, Chris Chris Butler is the we we both Chris is a dear friend. And Chris is so cool. we we both we both are like we both consider Robert to be like the guy. You know, we're we're and and many other people do, but if you know Chris Butler, he is a very a famous songwriter and a right. wonderful person, wonderful humanitarian, just a good all around good soul. And uh, and he and I both love Robert dear, dearly, like a father figure. He's he's. Uh, I, I feel honored to know the guy and the fact that like he calls me on my birthday or, so you know, cool. Jack, his brother Jack calls me on my birthday. You know, it's like just to be friends with those guys. And, you know, they don't, you know, they don't act like rock stars, you know, but they are. They And they're, you know, but they, they are. They are fucking huge talents. I mean, Jack Kidney is probably the best harp player I think there is, you know, hands down left in the world. I mean, people, oh, John Pumper, Blues Trent. No, no, no. You know, Jack Kidney is one of the few people that plays in the Little Walter style of Chicago blues that's even left in the world, you know. Right. I mean, he is the real deal and just incredible. I mean, he's, you know, and then you have Terry Hyde, you know, an incredible player who – you know, goes back to the 60s and Albert Eiler, Free Jazz, or Ornette Coleman and and Robert himself. You know, Robert, you know, Robert opened for the Stone Ponies as a solo artist when Linda Ronstadt was in the group. And, no, she you didn't. know, in La Cave, when the legendary club the Velvets used to play at, you know. I mean, so Robert goes back to the 60s, you know, with, well, you know, he knew, you know, Peter, Peter Lochner, you know, worshipped Robert, you know. Right. I was actually about to, I wanted to ask you about Peter. Cause I uh, Adele Berté just put out a book. Did you read that? Yeah. So did I have you know not him? Yet. I have not. But uh, I'm I'm very dear friends with Charlotte Pressler, Peter's uh, wife. Uh, is you know um, they yeah. weren't together when Peter passed away, but uh, I, I'm good friends with 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 Charlotte, and uh, I'm one of the few people she will still talk to about Peter, but only on a scholarly basis. I don't really. I don't try to exploit any of my friendships with people right. unless I ask them specifically. Like I'd been working on a book, my, my master's thesis that I used for my master's at, at, at uh, the university of Akron was about the fact that Cleveland outside of New York and London, Cleveland was the only underappreciated at the time. It's since been brought to light that Cleveland was as equally important in the development of punk rock and alternative music right. as New York and London. And even Clinton Halen, who wrote From the Velvets to the Voidoids, says that in his preface of his book. So I used my master's thesis to expound upon that. You know, the fact that the we, you know, the New York Dolls were playing Mercer Arts Center when, you know, the, the electric eels formed and were playing here right. and, and mirrors were playing and uh, rockets from the tombs were forming, you know, so... Um, you have those precursors of, you know, these proto-punk types that were way ahead of their time. And then you take the later incarnations of Perubu post-Rocket. Right. You know, Perubu is still an important group, still playing, still putting out vinyl records, you know, and they're one of the last sole survivors of any of that scene, original punk scene, you know. Right. Maybe one of the last, if not the last, from that era. And it's, it's cur- well, you think, well... Rocket from the Tombs broke up, and the, the you know the Dead Boys and Peru we went their own way, but the Dead Boys went and influenced so many more punk rock, so much more yeah. punk rock from the New York scene, and it, oh, big time. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just it because they were playing up in New York so much, uh, they ended up moving up there. At least half of them did. I mean, uh, Cheetah kind of flitted back and forth. He didn't really want to live in New York, but he did. Right. And then he ended up living there. But, uh, you know, Jimmy Zero and uh, Jimmy Zero has got to be one of the nicest people ever. You know, I love Jimmy. Anyways, side note. But, uh, yes, when the Dead Boys went to New York, they were probably the most aggressive of all the punk bands. I mean, they, you know, the Ramones were almost pop compared to the Dead Boys. And the Dead Boys were also great musicians as opposed to a lot of people think they were just raw. And they were. Right. You know, this was before Jeff Magnum was in the group. It was just Cheetah and Jimmy on guitars. Jeff Magnum came along later as their bassist, like right around their first album or so. But uh, 
really they were they were very raw. And Stib was an incredible performer. I mean, they pretty much blew a lot of those bands off the stage. You know, whether it was Blondie or whether it was uh, Television or even the Ramones. You know, but hey. the Ramones absolutely loved the Dead Boys and loved Stib, and everybody loved Stib. He was a pretty jovial guy. He was <laughs> a pretty funny character, and uh, so I mean, so yeah, the Dead Boys were were hugely influential. And, uh, of course, the Cramps, too. The Cramps were in New York in 75, 76. You know, I think they moved up there in late 75, maybe early 76. And now keep in mind, all these Clevelanders had moved up there, too. Uh, Cynthia Slay and Laura Kennedy, who were originally from Cleveland, uh, ended up going up and forming the Bush Tetras in in the late 70s. And, uh, you know, they had played, uh, you know, and then, you know, they had the No New York scene, which was happening in the late 70s as well. Pat Place from... uh, uh, who ended up being in the Bush Pet Tetris? She was in the the Contortions with you know, uh, there was with a, um, with Adele. It, yeah, right. Yeah, so Adele Adele's another one. Um, you know, John Morton from the uh, Electric Eels lived in New York briefly, and uh, even I think no, Jamie's been in Cleveland most of this time. Though he did live in uh, the Mirrors used to play up in New York as the Styrenes, I mean, Paul Murata and Jamie, and and I mean. But there was so many. Michael G. Michael Anthony was an, was another one who moved up to uh, New York and was in Buzz and the Flyers via Columbus. He was in Columbus for a while. Michael Michael Anton was his real name, but he went by Michael Gene and Buzz and the Flyers. But yeah, so many Clevelanders lived right. up in New York by this time. When I ended up going up there in the early eighties. You know, you could call up any Clevelander pretty much and sleep on their floor. You know, it, was, <laughs> it was just, it was just insane. There were so many of them up there, and uh, especially toward with the human switchboard in the early '80s up there. You know, people were just coming out of the woodwork to see them, and uh, you know, it was, it was really just, it was such an incredible time. It really, really was. And and I got to see like, I remember going to the Peppermint Lounge and seeing the fucking Heartbreakers, you know, with Walter Lohr and yeah, yeah. Johnny Thunders and Billy Rath was, you know, was in the band and Jerry Nolan was no longer in the band at that time, but still it was like just incredible, you know, to see these legends and shit. It was just fucking unbelievable, man. I mean, the, the shit we were able to do and witness and oh my God, it was, and of course, New York then was a cesspool, you know, there'd be yeah. dead junkies and winos on the Lower East Side where I'd be staying with friends and, you know, it was, it was a shooting gallery on every corner and you get, you really had to watch out from getting robbed or killed or stabbed or shot or it was insane. Absolutely fucking insane. I remember getting chased by Puerto Rican gangs on the Lower East Side because you know they they, they wanted to rob us of you know our we of our dope and our money. You know, was, you you had to take whenever you play up there at like CBS and you'd stay in the city. If you had a van full of gear, you had to like take everything you could carry right. up to like a three or four story walk up so it wouldn't get stolen out of your vehicle. You know, it's yeah. just oh, so crazy. Unloading <laughs> after you unload to unload. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, exactly. And Damn. you have to do that two or three times over your stay. Yeah. You know, how, wherever you're playing or rehearsing. Occasionally people at the music building at 38th and I think it was 38th and 8th. I might be wrong about that, but they used to let us store our gear there overnight and then go get it loaded in the van, drive it down to whatever venue we were playing, load it in, play, go back, load it back in, you know, but that's kind of how New York was back then. It was crazy. Just, just absolutely crazy, but it was exciting. Right. You know, we were young and, the world was our oyster, as they say. I mean, my God, it was it was just fucking insane. And you'd see everybody on any given night. You know, you'd go to CBGB's and there'd be, you know, Dee Dee or Johnny or Matt Dillon or somebody was down there. And somebody would be watching your band. You know, Woody Allen was there when the Terrible Parade were playing one time. And I had just all sorts of shit. We were, Madonna was in the middle of her, uh, Madonna was filming a movie there one time and we were there and. I just all sorts of crazy shit was going on. There's always something going on when you were there. Right. Um, well, that's you know. why it's so exciting because you never know what's going to happen. And it's like how you said, <laughs> such a, 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 cesspool, a cesspool of everything. Yeah. <laughs> And it really, it really was. And there were so many great nightclubs and so many cool venues and so many hip people and hip stores and just, you know, trash and vaudeville or granny takes a trip or, you know, Manny's music. And, you know, just, I mean, oh, just, it was, it was really something. It was exciting, you know, but, but any city was exciting. I mean, right. I remember playing, you know, when the Kingpins and the Pagans were playing like 
you know, we're playing like you know, the in Dayton or we're playing Columbus or we're playing, you know, Cleveland even. I mean, it was just, there was even in Cleveland before they changed the drinking age from 18 to 19 and then later from 19 to 20, which I actually lived right. 21. I actually lived through that. I was 18. They changed the drinking age to 19. I turned 19. They changed it to 21. And then when they, when they changed it to 21, all the mom and pop bars in Cleveland closed up. So like it, killed the indie music right. scene in cleveland absolutely killed it you know and it made it harder to play it made it harder for bands to get gigs in town and everybody Paid. had to fight for every other gig right it's just crazy it was, just it was crazy. i was a uh, delts was saying, tell, saying the same thing about new york when they changed to drinking age and yeah peter peter had like a, a pretty big deal with bringing the new york crew like getting television and stuff to come to cleveland and helping like established that early like punk scene in Cleveland, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Peter was very adept. I mean, he, he would go up to New York, he'd see bands and he'd come back and he'd rave about them. Of course he'd write about them too. He was right, and cream. friends with Lester Bangs and he'd write for cream or he'd write for, you know, whoever. And uh, he was, he was, you know, he was ranting and raving about all sorts of people, whether it was Patty Smith or television. And yeah, he was instrumental. If you pardon the pun in bringing television out here to Cleveland when they played the Piccadilly uh, Inn. You know, I mean, the notorious 75 gig, you know, right. I mean, Jesus, talk about legendary. And that was the night that uh, Rocket from the Tombs broke up. And then they went, uh, uh, Johnny Medanski or Johnny Blitz and Sheeta and Stiv went on to form Frankenstein, which turned into the Dead Boys. And then Peter and, and David ended up forming Perubu after that. And that was uh, the beginning of the punk scene, sort of, <laughs> right. even though they were proto-punks, it was still a... Uh, Still a little bit before their time, but they, that just goes to show. And, and David hates that whole tag. David Thomas hates that whole punk rock tag. It's right. He, he never wanted the industrial music tag or the punk rock tag. I mean, they just are. They're just a, like a, a a movable art piece. I mean, that's that's Ubu in a, in essence. Definitely. But yeah, you know. But they they were they still are incredible. And I'll tell you tell you an odd story. Uh, you know about Perubu is like just as I joined the Butthole Surfers. Yeah. Uh, in 1993, I get a call from the late Jim Jones, who was one of the, my dearest friends, and everybody loved Jim Jones. He was a nice, we, everybody called him the nicest guy in rock and roll, and he certainly was. He called me right after I joined the Butthole Surfers, he, he's, and we, I was getting ready to do that world tour with Butthole Surfers. He's like, Marky, uh, Tony's leaving the band. We'd like you to replace him on bass. And I was like, Oh my God, really? You know, right. and and I had to fucking turn him down because I'm a one. I'm I'm a man of my word, and two, I looked at the opportunity to play with the Butthole Surfers, who I'd been friends with, and they had asked me to join the band and play with them. I mean, I'm not as a band member, but join right. play For with the, the tour. group and yeah, and tour. You know, and and you know, and I love Perubu, but I knew David was difficult, you know, right, right. and, and I, as much as I love Jim Jones and was honored, incredibly honored to be replacing the amazing Tony M Mamone and that they would even consider me for that. Cause I played both guitar and bass equally in different groups. Right. And I, I'm, I'm happy on either instrument. It doesn't matter. But, um, I, I turned him down and I, I don't regret it. Uh, I mean, but it made me sad because yeah. I love Jim Jones. It would have been wonderful to play with him. And who knows? Maybe I would have lasted. Maybe I wouldn't have, but I recommended Michelle Temple and she's still with them. Jim hired her and she's still playing with Perubu. So there you go. So it all worked out, you yeah. know, and, and that's, that's the beauty of what we do and what happens in life. And, and um, I still love Jim Jones, even though he's passed on and, you know, and, and uh, he was just a wonderful soul. And I, I, do, I am sad in one respect because it, that could have been some neat Cleveland lim lineage. But, you know, you can't you can't look at it that way. It's like right. I had a, I had uh, how could you turn out a run with butthole surfers? Right. I mean, no, you know, and and I think that's one of uh, the, the, uh, the honor of the word. I imagine that has to run rampantly through everything you do with all these different things happening. Right. Because oh, opportunity yeah. would be like endless especially when you've developed all these skills that you've had and get offered by all these different people because now you're the guy that's going out playing with the big bands you know well, let's get him in yeah. the band like so the, yeah to, the, it, it, no absolutely absolutely it's been it's been an honor to to know and to play with these people and to call my friends and 
you know, and to still be friends with these people, whether it's on Facebook in isolation or, you know, that I, I'm still friends with these people and I'm still, and a lot of my road friends, you know, a lot of the road crews and bands and people I've worked with, I'm still friends with them and I still love them and we're still family. You know, it's, there's Dave, David Johansson said about Johnny Thunders after he died, he said, uh, somebody asked him if he loved Johnny or whatever. And he's like, David said, uh, what do you mean? We went through the war together, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> yeah. it's true. It's like, you know, they, what we do, it's, it's like us against the world. It is kind of like war. I mean, not, you know, not in a literal sense, but in a figure of figure of sense, right. Uh, figuratively speaking. So it, it really is. Like I said, when you see those people you used to tour with all those years ago and you see them again, you just pick up where you left off and it really was us against the world. And, and, and that's kind of how you feel like, you know, and, uh, yeah, I got another funny David Johansson story for you. I, all right. I used to work at Nautica back in the 80s as a stagehand. Yeah. And uh, you got a picture of like little Marky Ray, like little Marky Ray. So, you know, so like I, 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 I'd i done some things up to this point. I'd worked for the Stones. I'd worked for the Who, you know, doing the stadium shows. So I'm working for Balkan at, at Nautica as a stagehand. And David Johansson comes in as Buster Poindexter doing his Buster Poindexter show. Okay. So there's like 500 ticket sales in this place that holds 5,000 people. You know, and David comes sauntering backstage before the show and he comes up to the table where we're all sitting and he's like introduces himself and, 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 uh, you know, and I'm like, hi, Mr. Poindexter, it's really nice to meet you. You know, and he's like, he's like, call me David, you know, and he's, <laughs> he talks like Harvey Firestein, you know, yeah. and he's like, call, call me David. And I'm like, I'm like. I'm like, you know, I'm like, Mr. Point next to you, the New York Dolls help you get through high school. I learned all my guitar licks from you guys, and I just want to say thank you for changing my life. You know, that kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, rock and roll worship kind of shit. And he's like, oh, that really warms my heart. <laughs> 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 just like that, you know. He's just the sweetest fucking guy. So uh, that that's that was my go-to story of David for, for years. Years later, when the Dolls reformed in the early 2000s, they came back and played the beach land and I got to work for him twice oh, and I cool. got to see David and Sylvain again. And that was yeah. really kind of cool. That's so that so was, that cool. was neat. You know, it had come full circle again. And so I'm standing on stage working for Sylvain doing his guitars and, uh, Dave, I'm wearing this shirt that says fucking classy on it. And David turns around to me and gives me this thumbs up, like right on. <laughs> and then he starts into the song, like looking for a kiss. It was really funny. So I, I just love shit like that, you know, just like little, little things like that. So, Man, it's just it's just funny stuff. That's funny so, fucking stuff. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, but the that uh, to go back to the working with Dave Thomas, that would definitely have been a that would have been a, a definitely a, a probably a difficult situation. <laughs> that guy's pretty well, yeah. particular. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the thing is with uh, you know, and nothing against David because right. I mean I'm friends with him and, and I, no, I love the guy. I, I I can't. He's another one. Like I can't say I know well, but how many people know David well? That's good, you know, I, yeah. I knew now keep in mind, I'd already been out on tour with Jeff Conley of the liars. I love Jeff dearly. We're still friends, but he is very difficult to work for. If we fucked up on stage, he'd turn around and yell at us and we didn't play with a set list. I mean, that liar shit I knew verbatim. I didn't have to read music. I just had to play, you know, and he'd turn around, he'd go, he'd yell a song like soapy and we, we, you know, two, three, four, we go into it, you know, no set list, no sound check, no line check. We just get up and play. And that's what we did, you know, and Jeff was very difficult to deal with. He was an alcoholic at the time. He was very, very moody, bipolar almost, you know, but uh, he's since sobered up as we all have. And, and he's really cool. I mean, I've since uh, corresponded with him. I've sent him some recordings that I had from that tour that I got on tour many years later. Like people are like, oh, I, I was a sound man on that show. Here's a tape from that. Oh, cool. Oh, thanks. Shit. You know, so I that's gave cool. him copies of that and. You know, but I'd also worked with Trent Reznor at that point, too. And, you know, Trent was a uh, was a taskmaster. And I'm not right. knocking him. It's just he's a perfectionist. And if shit broke and didn't go right, well, he'd get upset. And rightfully so. He right. made, made us a lot of money to make shit work right. And now, granted, a lot of it was broken and we did the best we could. But, you know, so at that point in my career, when uh, Jim asked me to join Perubu, I was a little reticent. I was a little like, I don't think I really want to step down this road because I knew David could be very difficult. And then right. years later, I was to find out from friends of mine who were in the band and working with him that he in fact was very difficult. And yeah. I actually told, I actually told, uh, 
uh, Jack Kidney, Robert's brother, about that story about almost joining Perubu and 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 now Jack and Robert are both toured with David, yeah. and uh, so they know him well. They've they've done shows with Perubu. Yeah, and they, been, Perubu and, brought him over right across across exactly. the pond. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so they know David. And they, they, Robert's known David for years, and 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 David has actually said on occasion that uh, the only person, that, the only thing that scares David is Robert Kidney. <laughs> he said, is, "Is Robert Kidney staring at him from across the room in an angry fashion?" Is the only thing that scared David Thomas, <laughs> something to that effect, which is true. I've seen Robert kill with a stare, so you don't want to be on that that end of that. But uh, I, I told I told Jack, I was telling Jack about the story of almost joining Perubu, and I said, "Yeah, I'd already worked with some difficult people." at the time and jack kind of leans in and he's like well marky you know david is rather difficult he, I, you might call him the textbook definition of difficult okay <laughs> you know and, and and he didn't mean any disrespect right, it's just right. he knows how he is you know right. and, and like, you know and there's something to that there's something to knowing the vision and knowing what you want like with Trent exactly. or dave and and not being afraid to accept nothing other than that like, exactly <laughs> <laughs> and and he has every right to want right. what they, they all do as artists, you know. If you hire somebody to do something and they, you know, and they're they're not pulling their weight, well then, you know, things have to change or right. somebody's got to somebody's got to change or change for the better hopefully. But yeah, it's it's uh but yeah, so that was just, you know, one of many like opportunities, you know, that I've I've had to like turn down. I mean, you know, I remember when I joined Jim Rose Circus, Robert uh, DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots wanted yeah. me to will be his technician and work for him. And I had to turn him down. And that, that was made me sad too. Cause I love Robert and he's a great guy, but you know, the Jim Rose was the opportunity of a lifetime. And right. I don't, I don't regret that, you know, join so. the circus and a sick one that ends up opening for nine inch nails. It doesn't get cooler than that. Well then, then like right before the Tonys went out with red hot chili peppers. Right. Uh, Dave Navarro called me. He's like, Marky, I want you to be my guitar tech for the Red Hot Chili Peppers on this tour. And I'm like, well, Dave and I said, I I'm sorry. I got I got to tell you, uh, I got to turn you down as your technician, but I'm going to see you in a couple weeks. <laughs> I'll be out there with the Tonys. And sure enough, I saw him and everything was great. And, you know, we picked up right where we left off and there was no hard feelings and we're all still friends, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's it's like, you know, all the gigs you turn down, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's a few regrets there, but you know, at the same time, what can you do? You know, you, you got to live your life. You got to do certain, certain things and some things work out and some things don't, but just, just to have the opportunity right. to do that shit, you know, is like, is, is really a, a, a cool thing. And I'm, I'm grateful to be able to tell the story. I'm grateful. I'm still here. You know, right. like I said, I mean, if, if, you know, I, so many opportunities to like buy the farm <laughs> and almost did buy the farm. You know, I mean, you know, there's certain shit I don't talk about. There's a lot of dark right. stuff that happened out there with various artists and myself and, and you know, and, 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 uh, you know, my own addictions and, and failings as a, you know, as a person or whatever, you know, I mean, I, I'd like to think I've done and been a, a decent person, but I mean, we all have, uh, issues, you know, I right. had the, the, the drug issues and, you know, but one thing that's kept me working and I tell my students this all the time is I was always honest, you know, I, I never, you know, I always took the blame if I did something wrong and I always fessed up if something happened and, you know, and, and, uh, you, you be honest, you know, I've, I never so much as lost a dime as a tour manager. I never ripped anybody off. I can sleep well at night. You know, I didn't sell out. I didn't sell my soul to anybody. And, you know, I mean, believe me, <laughs> if I could have sold out and made a lot of money, I went, well, first I would have never gotten in this business in the first place. And second of all, I'd be living in a much <laughs> fancier, you know, uh, you know, digs and a, a fancier homestead. If I suppose, if I uh, sold out all those years, I mean, I used to tell to tell the students, it's like, man, I've been trying to sell out for forty fucking years, and then the paycheck never came in. I mean, I can't tell you how much shit the terrible parade got blown back. Like, like I said, because we actually right. were driven. We, you know, we here we were contemporaries of REM, and all people used to write about with us all the time was, oh, you sound like REM, and it's like, no, we don't. We're two guitars, and I play lead guitar, and Alan plays lead guitar simultaneously. We don't sound like R.E.M. Our, Alan tends to sing these pretty love songs, but yeah, I guess if you think we sound like R.E.M., fine. And then the Smiths came along. It's like, oh, Alan sounds like Morrissey, and you sound like Johnny Marr. And I wish I could sound like Johnny Marr, but, you know, I mean, the guy's an amazing guitarist. Right. You know? But but that was the bane of our existence, was Cleveland basically from 1980 till about 19... 
90 there was no there was like a press blackout and not to speak ill of michael stanley you know because i i i'm not yeah but uh a lot of a and r people you know artists and repertoire people at labels in the 80s would come to town and they'd be like well you got michael stanley you know, you know what else you got and they would kind of ignore all the other things that like us that were bubbling under get it, you know, but we weren't considered commercial enough for right. labels to sign back then. And we didn't have the oomph of the Homestead records behind us like death of Samantha did, but you know, I, in, in their defense also, they didn't tour as much as they probably should have, you know, I mean, uh, before I was even in them, I mean, they were kind of, you know, John had the job at the plane dealer and Doug worked at like, you know, various places and whatnot. And it's not like any of us could just pick up and go on tour. But I mean, I think if Death of Samantha had maybe been, uh, you know, put out, I mean, they put out great records, but it's like it, had they been able to tour more and get seen more, they may have been able to hang on longer and maybe get more of a foothold in the alternative scene, which obviously right. came later with the breaking of Nirvana and whatnot. But, you know, it was weird when Nine Inch Nails broke, when we started going from clubs to larger venues, I mean, there was like what I call the black clad masses of kids, you know, in their black clothes, just fucking <laughs> coming out of the, like, they crawl out of the woodwork and they're tattooed and branded with like dreadlocks, white kids. And you're like, where the fuck have you people been? You know, like, where right. the fuck did you come from? It was absolutely insane, you know? And, but, but before you knew it, there's like this new tribalism in the country with these, like I said, tattooed, branded, pierced, you know, right. dreadlocked white ki you know, kids of all races, really. But I mean, especially the, the the white alternative kids, you know, like that had been listening to the Pixies and Jane's Addiction and even Mission of Burma back in the 80s. And, you know, but we're digging, you know, Sonic Youth and, you know, and, and, and Nirvana. I mean, right. it's it's just like that whole watershed of the 91, 19, 30 years ago, 1991 with uh you know, Lollapalooza and then boom, right after that Nirvana's Nevermind broke and then the whole flood floodgates just boom, you know. Then the next thing you know, it's Green Day and the offspring and Kurt kills himself and then, you know, grunge was, you know, dead after that for the most part. But, you know, sadly I knew, you know, I knew every one of those cats who was famous, you know, from Kurt to, you know, Scott Whelan to yeah. Lane Scaly and uh, you know, Chris Cornell was a friend. I mean, a dear friend. And Chris, uh, Chris hurts the most because I knew Chris well. And and uh, you know, of course, Kurt was nice, and Whelan yeah. was nice too, and and Lane Staley was a sweetheart. But I didn't know him really well like I knew Chris. But I mean, you know, and there were there were others too. I mean, just pretty much anybody from that ilk that died of a heroin overdose or any of that. But David Kerr, my late friend from the from Guns N' Roses, died of heroin uh, an overdose in nineteen ninety six. You know, and it was like we started losing people left and right. It was yeah. really fucking sad. And, uh, you know, that's the shit that haunts you is, is that kind of stuff, you know. Right. I mean, uh, you know, but once again, I'm glad I lived through it and I'm glad I experienced all those stuff. I mean, that, yeah, that, that, how can you not be like those are insane <laughs> memories to have? What an insane track of a career just to, in <laughs> yeah. just. Life is nothing but exciting from one thing to the next, and everything's a new challenge to figure out. That's you know that's like the that's like the 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 job you want to have to always be actively engaged and actively actively aware and excited to be doing the thing. And like absolutely, you know, absolutely. Then, then, like, I'd, I'd be doing a job, and then and Kurt Cobain thinks your guitar playing is cool. You wrote yeah. about that in your book, and I was like, "Yeah, like, it's, what? How cool is that shit?" You know what I mean? And like, no, it, it really was. I mean, it was funny too because. I think that was at the LA forum um, or it might've been a little later in that tour, but he, yeah, he came up to me and he was like, he was like, man, I didn't know you played with the band. That's really cool. And ironically, big John Duncan, who was the guitarist in the exploited had been Kurt's guitar tech previous to that tour. He later switched over to Pat, but Jim, uh, my friend Jim became Kurt's guitar tech at that time. And uh, but but Big John Duncan had been playing second guitar with Nirvana before Pat joined on a few songs. So so here was Big John Duncan, who was a technician like me, you know, and was playing with the band, too. So that was that was cool as well. So I just thought that was neat that he Kurt saw me play with them. He thought it was cool. And um, he just, he, he, you know, it was just neat that that uh, that he, he saw that and considered that, you know, something. And I yeah, maybe no, happy so that, sick. That, that, that they watched the show and 
uh, another funny story about the forum is I hadn't met them just yet. And uh, at the LA forum, there's this backstage hallway that has two doors on either end and it's about a hundred feet long. So I like walked out of the butthole surface dressing room into this hallway. And then all of a sudden the door opens at one end and it's Kurt and he's walking towards me and I'm like, Oh fuck. And I'm like walking towards him trying to get down to the other production office. And like, he gets like right in front of me and I, I'm looking at him and I go, Hey, how's it going? And all of a sudden he belches in my face, like a kid from high school, you know, like, and kept walking, you know, and that was my first introduction to Kurt Cobain. And he came by, he came by the dressing room later and we rapped and he was really nice. That predated the, that was right before he told me about, uh, you know, my guitar playing. Right, right. But that was that was my introduction to Kurt Cobain was was that belch in the hallway. And I just thought that was, I laughed out loud because I just thought that was so funny. What a greeting. It, it totally reminded me of something like something a high school kid would do. It was awesome. It was funny. As, it was funny as hell. And then they came to our dressing room, Butthole Surfers. It was Kurt and Courtney and Francis Bean, like I said, she was a baby. Right. And in the dressing room, it's like, you know, Flea and Anthony are there, Kim and Thurston from Sonic Youth. Watt and George from Minutemen, uh, Alex Winter from Bill and Ted is there, Johnny Depp is in there, um, you know, everybody's there just hanging out in the Butthole Surfers dressing room, you know, and it's it's just, that was LA and Butthole Surfers and, you know, on the Nirvana tour, everybody came to see us, you know, and all these, um, like a lot of famous uh, producers and stuff would drop by too, I mean, all sorts of fucking people, you know. Of course, we'd run into like Gene Simmons a Kiss, or we'd run into, you know, people like that. And then there'd, there'd be other people that, you know. But Bruce Fairborn, this producer, uh, produced a lot of rock and roll records and stuff. He he came yeah. to see us in Vancouver on that tour, and you know, I'd I'd bring people back all the time to meet him and say hi. And, it was crazy. But yeah, Jim Jarmusch used to come see the butthole surfers every time we were in New York. And the funny thing is, is he'd be standing in the punter line, you know, and I'd go out there and go, Jim, clear, clear. And I'd drag him <laughs> in the back area and drag him over to Gibby, you know. And, and he's from Akron. Jim Jarmusch is from Akron. Oh, so I, I talked to him about Akron and shit, you know. And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and of course, Robert Quine. I met Robert Quine many, many years ago when he was from Akron, too. You know, I met him when he was playing with Lou Reed. And he was great. I mean, I, Robert Quine is like one of the greatest guitar players of all time. And uh, I mean, the shit he did with that Richard Held the Voidoids Blank Generation album is just insane. I mean, that's like the the that's like the pinnacle of of amazing avant guitar playing in, yeah. in terms of like the shit they played. He and Ivan Julian as a, as a team were just incredible guitar players. I mean, Richard Held didn't know how good he had us with with Robert Quine and Ivan Julian. What a what a team! But that's just so crazy, sick. man. That that record's so sick. And oh, I, I agree 100% with <laughs> what you said with the guitars. And oh, like... liars beware! That song with those guitars and that just absolutely rips it still rips it's one of my top 10 favorite songs of all time and and i have a lot of favorite songs <laughs> that's one of them but yeah that that lead that that quine plays on that is just fucking sick i mean god damn and the, the rhythm part that ivan julian's playing is like i still can't figure out how the fuck he did that you know <laughs> <laughs> i mean i've tried a little bit over the years but that's that gets back to the mystery of rock and roll sometimes you don't want to know how people do shit right. you know because it, it ruins it for you See, sometimes things have to just remain a mystery. <laughs> True. And that's kind of the beauty of what we do, you know? It's like, you know, there's there's shit I'll take to the grave that I'm never going to tell anybody. There's shit I saw and witnessed and stuff I did, you know? But, you know, it was it was, it was was crazy. I'm just, I, but I'm, I'm still like, like amazed at some of the shit I got to do. And, you know, it's it's funny sometimes because you'll, you'll talk to people about these things and, you know, you'll see bands coming, like bands coming to Blossom all the time. They don't know me from Adam, you know, and right. they'll be like, oh, you know, they'll see a Nine Inch Nails thing. They'll be like, oh, I like that band. I'll be like, oh, uh, you see, yeah, I was Trent Reznor's first and longest tenured guitar tech. And he's like, really? You know, <laughs> they start, start some conversation or some shit or, you know, there'll, there'll be some name on a case. And they'll be, oh yeah, I worked for those because I was on that tour. And, you know, now I'm, now I'm one of those old timers, you know, that all the kids like, did you really do that? Well, you know, and your students watch your jaws drop when you tell them all the shit you did. And it's like, it's crazy. But that's so cool. And then that validates <laughs> all this madness. You know what I mean? And it's... Oh, absolutely. It really, it really does. It, it does. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm, grateful i'm still here and grateful i can you know talk to you about this stuff and you know it's funny because my wife's always like why don't you get paid for these things why don't you do you know it's like 
you know, whatever, you know, maybe someday I'll do a, a talking tour, you know, go out and tell do Marky Ray telling stories. Cause I thought about doing a stand up bit for a while. I thought it'd be yeah. really funny. Just tell backstage rock and roll right. stories all night, you which totally would be hilarious. Shit. Yeah. Cause, cause there, yeah. So, you know, so I might do something like that, you know, bet if, and when we ever get past COVID, you know, but uh, I mean, this has put the kibosh on a lot of things, but at the same time, you know, talking to people like yourself and just ensuring that people carry the stories along, you know, right. And, and, you know, it's, it's good to do this and uh, I'm glad to talk to you about this stuff and, you know, I'm glad you're recording it down for posterity. Cause it's like, there, you know, I've been trying to write a book about this shit for years. You know, it was sort of an extension, a blowout of my, uh, of my master's thesis. But while I was doing that, you know, I started in 2010 on my master's and then I graduated in 2014 on, uh, you know, actually with the master's degree. But I started writing about all this stuff in 2010 and started just just thinking about a second book of material. And it started like with 20 questions. I asked all these people. Sadly, all these a lot of them have passed on, like Mike Hudson from the Pagans and, you know, uh, my late friend Bobby Horstemeyer passed out, passed away and Peter Ball and uh from you know burning the invisibles and then you know, of course jim jones passed away so a lot of these people that i talked to had passed on and then people for the punk scene started writing their own books you know john morton started writing about the eels and people started writing about peter and right. uh cheetah chrome put out his book so there was wasn't really like a, a point for me to like kind of tell my perspective of a lot of this stuff and so i kind of it just it's been on a back burner for a while so i've kind of put a lot of these things in just on the back burner and kind of uh waited for the right time to either pull these things out or figure out a way to how to do them because i don't know if writing a, a book is the best way to tell all this stuff it's almost like like you know talking to you here on a podcast it's like this this is the way to tell some of this stuff right now you know, and um, I mean, books are great, but sadly, a lot of people don't buy books. Nobody wants to pay for books. They you know, I mean, yeah, it takes it takes time, takes editing. And it's like in this instant age, it's 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 it's, it's, it's better to be able to just kind of like like do this stuff. Like I now one thing that's happened is I've inherited like from my late friend Bobby and Peter Ball and Jim, I actually inherited their collections of Cleveland punk rock ephemera. Oh, so I'm, I'm on the board of Neo Sound at the at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Archive and Library. So I've made it a point to enshrine them with all the Cleveland music ephemera that I can, just yeah. to preserve this stuff. So I'm, you know, I'm not an, a, 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 I, I am an archivist. And that's kind of what I've become now is saving all this music history stuff. Like I have rare recordings of Peru, who I have rare recordings of the cramps. I have rare recordings of all my bands and Cleveland bands and ephemera and pictures and, and pagan stuff. I have rare pagans recordings and, 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 you know, half of Peter Ball and Bernie and the invisible stuff, you know, and, and, and I see it as my goal now is to carry on, carrying on this stuff you know to to tell their stories to tell the stories about jim and peter and bobby and and all the other punks that came before us because if i don't who the fuck else is going to do it i right. mean there's there's people like jimmy image in akron and uh, paul rogers is, is one of his acolytes down there who's helping out with that stuff but jimmy image and myself are like the two cleveland northeast ohio punk archivist collectors that have these massive collections of ephemera and then my other friend, Ken Dixon, is more on the like the jam band, the Cleveland indie scene with like, you know, Ital and Roberus and uh, the Janglers and a lot of uh, Cleveland music uh, people, like a bit more of the Overland commercial stuff. Yeah. So Ken is archiving all that stuff, too. So there's a body of us as archivists now that we're really preserving and, and uh, promoting a lot of the Cleveland punk and alternative and indie music stuff that's come out of here for all these years. So that's kind of our, been our mission statement is to just preserve this stuff. And, you know, I'm aligned with Cindy Barber in the Beachland and the Beachland has its own uh, Cleveland rocks uh, archive the site and being tied in with the rock hall archive and library, the, you know, it, with Neo sound, I brought Chris Butler into that fold. Uh, so there's, there's a number of us that are really making 
efforts to preserve and protect this stuff and its legacy, you know, and that includes, you know, talking to Michael about the cramp stuff and trying to preserve that stuff right. that we have. And, you know, so we're, we're just trying to do the best we can and tell the stories as best we can. Well, and uh, definitely you know. doing it. And like, even just to speak on the book you've put out, cause I, I bought that like a week ago and was trying to get through it to, to talk to you. Right. And oh, I, cool. I, I didn't get you. through the whole thing, but that was really well written. And just how you narrated well, well, your that's, story that's through nice that. I'd like to hear because I've become a much better writer since then. You know, I mean, those things really were just lectures right. off the top of my head, kind of like we're doing now. It was me like rambling on about these things, but they were very thoughtfully put together. And just how, like, as far as like, if I wanted to learn more about booking a, 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 a full-fledged tour i'm definitely yeah. going back to those notes when start stuff starts picking up because i've tried Good. forever to book a tour and it's always been like the i got one venue guys exactly exactly and and, and that's kind of what it is it's kind of like a roadmap for it's like i said it's a way to you know in the in the preface it's like you know uh, crawl your way in because you got to crawl yeah. before you can walk crawl your way into the music industry and and really that that was completely written with no references in, in like a, a, a peering or two, it, this predated, it predated Wikipedia in some respects. I mean, I was basically just out there, you know, telling all these stories from memory, you yeah. know, just writing them down almost like stream of thought. But it was like, you know, this is what goes into doing a show day. And this is what you do as a tour manager. And this is what you do as a production manager. And this is like, you know, like the butthole surfers in Philadelphia on that tour. And that shit really happened. And, you know, it was like, but I, I read that story to my students the other night. I do, I'm teaching remotely on zoom this semester until, you know, the beach sand yeah. opens back up. So, but yeah, that's exactly it. And thank you for buying the book. That means a lot, you know, and yeah. thank you for the compliments because I consider myself a much better writer and historian even now, but just because I've learned so much in the previous years, but uh, right. But so yeah, it, when you go to do round two, <laughs> it, it maybe 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 what you do is the spoken word tour thing, or maybe you do this like maybe you do a podcast with those few homies and like connect, reach out through the three of you guys. You can really document it, or yeah, collab I mean, and there's, a there, there's a lot we could do. I mean, one thing I've got an entire I, I have 15 volumes of binders of. Uh, cleveland punk flyers and it would be amazing to make like like a coffee table book yeah. uh, i'm friends with this woman tequila mockingbird out in la and she's from cleveland originally and she she runs the la punk museum and i thought if this shit ever lifted i know there's a new york punk museum too it'd be kind of fun to like put out a punk rock flyer book and then go out and you know do that yeah. spoken word tour do that stories tour and like i did do a running set list one time of just funny backstage stories and it was like there was so many of them i had pages and pages of funny shit i mean it was just like oh my god that's hilarious or oh i forgot about that or oh this is a a great talking point i mean right you know it's it's it, you know because I, I can't tell excuse me i can't tell a joke to save my life but i can tell a story like it's nobody's business Clearly. like read the liar story in the back if you haven't got to that yet the liar story because that really happened both of those stories in there and that that's particularly hilarious that the liars tour and it's true it's really fucking true and uh and uh just it's it's amazing and the funny thing is about the liar story is what on the second Lollapalooza tour when i started singing uh, the dead boys uh you know uh, uh, sonic producer with Pearl Jam. When I first met Jeff Ament from the from the Pearl Jam, he was like, "I heard you were in the Liars," and I was like, "Yeah." And he goes, <laughs> "He goes, I was at that show in Seattle, no the shit. one where you drummer through and through the, you know." I was like, "You were at the Central Tavern." He's like, "Yeah." And it turns out all these members from like future grunge bands like were at that show in Seattle where Dave Bass, our drummer, beans Jeff Jeff Conley with his drum throne. And it's a, it's a whole story. I'll let you read it. I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's, it's fucking hilarious. But it's true. It really happened. You know, and the way I described Jeff getting hit, it's like that is exactly what it looked like. You, you got to see it. You got to re read that story and you'll love it. So, Yeah, I, I got halfway through it. And then like I was just because I was I, I made all these notes here to like ask you, but we kind of walked right through it, which was awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, thank you. That, no, it was so cool. And like, man. No, Marky, this has been awesome. I just, I really well, appreciate you. you taking time out to yak with me. And I know, like, like I was telling you before, teaching as well, and how much that fucking trying to figure out this whole technological realm of it kicks your ass. You know what I mean? 
It's oh, I so, know exactly what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. Exhausting because you over you over amp yourself to deliver and you don't get that back because you're via screen. Like when you're yeah. talking. Do with you someone. teach as well? Are yeah, you yeah. Teacher as well? I teach a uh, I teach at uh, three charters. It's a charter school with three locations. Wow. Um, and I teach an adapted music program for kids yeah. with autism, pre K to senior high. Oh, good, for, good for you. <laughs> Thanks. That's wonderful. I've that I've I've got some disabilities in my family, so that's that's nice to hear. I'm, I'm, that's really good of you. That's 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 good, honorable work. I'm I'm proud of you for doing that. Well, I appreciate it. It means a lot coming from you, yeah. man. Um, and I've been doing a, doing music full time too. So like, but that good. slowed down. And what's your uh, What's your main instrument? Guitar. I cool. sing and play guitar. I play in a band called C Level, letter C dash. And I know there's an S E A level. Figure that out way too late. Yeah, but, of course. But that's all right, man. Sticking what kind with of guitar it. you got? What's your what's your rig? Um, okay, it's wacky. I use a I use a twelve string acoustic. I got two of them. I got a Fender T Bucket Hellcat and uh Wow. And uh, and uh Mitchell. I don't remember the the size of it or the the exact model. But oh. I run these two pickups. I run the Fishman and I got a a um a Seymour Duncan uh, mag mic. I run that sure. into a, a mix. Like I have a, a line separator boss pedal. And then so I'll run these like open tuned electric, uh, open tuned acoustic guitars through like Marshall amps and shit. Wow. It's a goof. I'll send you a video. Of what we, of that our, sounds like John McLaughlin ter- territory. That sounds cool. Kind of. That's you know, right on. Right on. It's like, <laughs> where's Miles Davis when you need him? You know, it's like, you know, right on, man. No, that's awesome. I love open tunings. And I love. I, you know, I, one thing I feel really lucky about in my career is I never limited myself to one form of music. Right. I tried to play as many different things and as many different styles as I could, with the exception of commercial rock and roll and or classical and country. Though I played a lot of bluegrass and a lot of, uh, um, you know, alter, like 3D, for example, like alternative, right. you know, like all, almost all country bordering, bordering on, but but and I like old country. I just don't like a lot of the new slick country. But they pay my bills because I work at Blossom and I work with. But I I couldn't pick your I couldn't pick your Burks uh, your Dirks Bentley from your your. Uh, I mean I know I know I've worked for so many of these guys for so many times, but I couldn't pick a lot of these guys out of a lineup. But you know Toby Keith and Kenny Chesney. I mean they're 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 good cats. I mean I I got nothing. You know I have nothing against anybody making a living off this stuff and more power to them if they can, because you it's know, not it's easy. a tough yeah. road to hoe in this business. If you can just surviving in this business and being able to have a career and having to reinvent yourself. I mean, that's what I talk about in the book is like, you know, you, you may, you know, think you're the next Madonna or something or the next, you know, whoever Bruce Springsteen or whatever, but it's like you put out one record and you've, you've worked your entire life to put out that one record. Now you got to come up with another one in like six months, you know, and those were (laughs) your best songs you wrote over that time. And now you got to come up with another one and you got to keep that cycle going for years and years and years and have a following and have support and have label support and have the, the viability to connect with people uh, in, in a real world uh, you know, on a commercial level that you can sustain yourself, you know, uh, and, and some people got in under the bar and other people didn't. Uh, uh, Chuck Prophet's a, a friend of mine and he used to be in that band Green on Red, the 80s sort of indie band that was on Enigma Records and they were huge in Europe and, and Chuck plays like sort of all country, but he, he's like, Chuck plays a little bit of everything and he has both a band and does solo shows, but you know, I, I saw him a few years ago. It, he was at the beach and came in, and he used to live with some dear friends of mine out in San Francisco, so I got to know him real well, and we became friends over the years, and I'd see him when he'd pop in the beach land. And one day I was talking to him, and he, he goes, you know, Marky, I'm good for like two to 400 people in about any city in, a, in the world, and, you know, that's that's, that's all right. Right. You know, that, that's a living, you know? Yeah. It's like he, he doesn't need to be selling out arenas, and he's got a loyal fan base, and people love the guy. And it's like, you know, if you can do that, more power to you, you know, it's like, you know, the, look at the cramps. Like I said, you know, they were good for 2,500 to 5,000 people in just about every city in the, in the world, you know, right. and, and, but, and some people might think, well, that's not success, but no, I mean, that's a fucking, it's more than a living, you know, they, they lived well and they had a, a good life and they, 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 you know, I mean, you know, Lux has sadly passed on, but I mean, look at the influence and the wake they left. Definitely. I mean, look at how many people were honestly 
you know, influenced by them. Every every kid with flames on their guitar, or every, <laughs> yeah. every you know, every girl, every female guitar player who's playing a red Gretsch and a wearing boots and leather and and ripping it up, you know, or every guy who's out there with a pompadour haircut singing, you know, like a singing like Lux, you know, or right. just trying to be half as crazy playing rockabilly. It's like, you know, they they really they were something, you know, and they were. You know, they they may have been you know homage to their forebears, but man, they kicked it up and they kicked it all over the place. You know, they made they it were. all that music as exciting as it is. You know, oh, what I mean? yeah, and like because that, that that old rock and roll stuff is cool and exciting, oh, yeah. and it's straight. You know, it's like straight just rock and shit. And like, oh, the, it is. And it really is. That's why I was like, have been on the hunt to talk to Poison Ivy because th- there's not that many female fronted guitar players that kick that much ass. You know yeah. what I mean? And like, such a role model. And like, fucking, and she was like doing the business end of shit from what I've read. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Like, no, she, she did. She did. You know, I mean, Ivy, you know, uh, they, they, they both did. I mean, Lux did a lot of their videos and a lot of their photography, and, and Ivy did the business. And, you know, she, was a very astute businesswoman and uh you know really in a lot of respect she ran the show you know and it, it, you know not you know she and, and and she and lux were like a love story for the ages i right. mean they really they really were like i mean she you know she basically retired after he passed away and and basically you know his his sort of retired from society and, and who can blame her you know they had a wonderful run and lux was the love of her life and she you know she's she's going on to do her own thing now and, and that's that's the way it should be you know right right and uh you know i i don't know necessarily who's minding you know or if she's minding the store anymore it's 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 you know i imagine somebody has got is is dealing with stuff like that for you know but that i'm not privy to that information so i don't know but, uh, you know, as far as I know, the last time I talked to Michael about any of this stuff, that uh, basically what I told you is that she'd uh, changed her name and basically uh, retired from playing. Well, and uh, that's makes, where it stands at the right, moment. You know, right. I, I would love to see a resurgence in their, their uh, not her playing again necessarily, but I'd love to see, uh, you know, them be able to, their legacy be able to make some bread for her sake. And, and I'm sure it does. You know, I, I'm sure that there's, there's, there's money out there, you know, whether it's merchandising or whether it's reissues or whatnot, there's, there's somebody is, is, is minding the store, but it's like I said, I'm not privy to that. So it's, you know, but, uh, but yeah, what a legacy, you know, what a, what an incredible legacy. And it makes sense. What else would she do after that? You know what I mean? Like that's everything. Yeah. It makes sense that you would just well, be exactly. like, and, you know, let it Lux be legendary. Was de- Lux was a deeply spiritual person, you know, I mean, Lux interior, you know, people think, Oh, he, he got that for, you know, and this is, this is a little delving a bit into cramps floor, but I mean, Lux interior means inner light, <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, in Latin it's inner light. So, you know, he, uh, and most people think, oh, you got that, oh, Lux Interior, you saw that in a car magazine. Or, right. You know, cool. and, 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 and that's kind of how history is rewritten, it, and that's fine. You know, but but if you look a little deeper, <laughs> you know, look at the name, look what it says, you know. That's and, so uh, cool. you know, his, his yeah, and, and it's funny, too, because, you know, he, uh, he, he left such a legacy. I mean, a lot of people don't know that he was – he was being groomed to be on SpongeBob, and he actually was yeah. on SpongeBob. Tom Kenny was a, a a huge fan of theirs, and that Michael met Tom Kenny at his wake, and and uh, it's funny because Tom Kenny was like telling Michael, like, you know, oh, you should come. On. I keep bugging Michael. I'm like, Michael has the best voice. It's like an octave deeper than mine, and I can sing fairly low, but Mike's got that super low voice. You know, he can do all that crazy shit. Like, listen to 3D. Listen to us doing Run On. Yeah, by Elvis. Well, the Elvis cover. I mean, that's an old religious, uh, you know, traditional. But uh, but you know, listen to Michael sing on that, and and uh, I keep telling him, I'm like, Michael, you should do that. You know, just call up Tom and just say, hey, I'd like to do some voiceover work. You know, because it's incredible money. You know, and he's just Michael. So he's so uh, modest. You know, right. he's just like, nah. You know, but Michael is playing again, and he's he's we're fixing his amps. He's putting he put together his Michael Perkheiser music page. So friend that if you can. Uh, you, you know, find that and uh, we'll post some more stuff, some action stuff, and there'll be more music coming out eventually. You know, I don't know about the action, but you know, we're going to keep there. There is some 3D stuff coming out. And when we first started out, we were kind of a surf instrumental thing. So yeah. there's going to be a 3D EP coming out this, uh, 
on uh, Art Brassars. Uh, I can't, I'm not sure if that's his last name, right? But Art, Art from, it's like Surf Music okay. is putting out um, a 3D EP, you know, so that's going to be coming out fairly soon. Maybe this spring, I think, I hope. So fingers crossed, you know, that something like that will come out. And and that's always cool. It's nice when old music gets released. And I don't know if you saw my page a while back where I posted that uh, the Terrible Parade stuff's now getting placement in songs, so or in movies and stuff. And that's really exciting for me. You know, that's, no, that's, that's super exciting. cool. So you can finally get it out, cause especially that one you've been holding on to. You know, and like yeah. it's really your uh, your SoundCloud is like as far as like when I was reading up on like all these different bands, I looked each one up. And just to see what I can find by itself. And, like, yeah. I couldn't find that much of it. I found most of it off your SoundCloud. I was like, fuck. You know what I mean? Like, and like, well, uh, yeah, you need to check out my check out my YouTube channel, Crazy Man 13, because that I have like a hundred and some videos up of like basically during the pandemic at, the, at one point, I, I was so going out of my mind, I started making it one or two videos a day. Damn. So I started taking the back catalog and just slamming out these videos. And the images out of those came from my late friend Bobby's estate. And basically yeah. Bobby Horstemeyer was, he was the Pagans manager for the Pink album. And Bobby Horstemeyer was this, everybody called him Cat City Bobby because Cat City was this hippie commune up on Andorra. It's no longer there. It was torn down by the city of Cleveland last year, sadly. But yeah. Bobby for many, many years had this house up on Andorra in South Collinwood. And everybody went over there and Bobby helped fund the Cleveland Confidential EP and LP uh, with Bobby used to sell sacrament. You know what I'm saying? He used to sell all that sacrament to the various punks and even cops and FBI agents. And everybody used to go over there and buy herb from Bobby. So Bobby became this de facto like Bobby was a beatnik. He was a hippie. He was a, you know, he was all these things. And then he was a punk, you know, and, and then, but he was sort of the elder statesman, you know, Bobby knew Peter Lochner, he knew David, he knew all those people because he was of the same age and it right. them. So everybody used to go over there and buy stuff from Bobby. So now Bobby was a collector and he was also probably Mike Hudson worshiped Bobby because Bobby in Mike's opinion was the smartest, most, well-read person any of us had ever met and I, bobby was a mentor and a spiritual guide to me personally so when bobby passed away i inherited all the stuff that came out of his house so i filled my house with all like every kind of imaginable photography and rock and roll art book uh rare ufo book magazines and i'm talking boxes and boxes of this rare pornography rare photographs you you name it i filled my house with it so all the photos and those videos came out of shit from bobby's house and there's just some insane stuff that i use for those imagery for yeah. that imagery and all those videos so you'll just marvel at that shit you know that's so that's so cool it's so cool that you can put it out there too Oh, it is. That's great. You know, I mean, I've only got like 70 subscribers, you know, you need to get a thousand to start getting royalties and right. sell out. Right. <laughs> we were talking about the sellout. Show. Right. No, you know, I'm, I... I'm dying. I'm down with it, man. I, I want a thousand subscribers so I can start making money. My buddy, Ken, Ken Dixon, who I was talking about, he's got like well over a thousand subscribers and he's making, you know, like three to five hundred dollars a month just in Damn. royalties from from commercial placement of, right. of in, in his material i'm like dude i'm down you know <laughs> i'll monetize the shit out of that stuff it's hard you know? it's so hard to do though it's i know it is it really is man because there's billions of streams now so so bonkers man well that's gonna be Crazy. sick i'm I'm excited for the, the the new 3d stuff to come out for all this and to dive into the the videos and the end of the book into the i guess the fucking cool stories are in the back well, thank you. Thank you, man. I, I'm glad. And it's it's wonderful to talk to you. It's nice to meet you. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry we hadn't met earlier, but, you know, hey, that's life, you know. I'm but I'm sure. I'm still glad I'm here. So it's a, it's a cool thing. So Beautiful. All, all right, right man. David. I'll let you go, Marky. Well, thank you so all much, All right, man. man. Well, good luck with everything. Keep posted and stay in touch. And, yeah, check out – do yourself a favor. Check out my – go down the rabbit hole on my YouTube page. Let me know what you think. Will all do. Right? Will do. Thanks. Thanks, David. Have a good night, man. We'll talk soon. Peace. All righty. Later.